And we are the Coalition Loud and Proud, Outrage Porn Free, Civilly Disobedient Media, broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center, 90 Way Boston Street in Providence, in the heart of the city we love, the naked city, the city of 1,000 stories. Tonight's a very special evening. We're going to jumble up the format a little bit. And it's special for a couple of reasons. Uh, first off, we're going to have sort of an open mic here tonight. Last night, legislation was passed by our House of Representatives, echoing legislation passed earlier in the week by your state senate. And by all account, is on a fast track to get signed by your governor, Gina Raimondo. The legislation we'll discuss in detail in just a couple minutes with a special guest who's spent a lot of time with us here lately, and we're grateful for that. The circumstances that we, unfortunately, that we had to meet under, however, is a set of repressive le legislation that's aimed at a continuation of the failed war on drugs and actually working to vilify and further criminalize and further marginalize and perhaps put even in life-threatening danger folks in the user community who run afoul of our state's onerous laws regarding well, prescription painkillers, opioids. It's the opioid epidemic. Whatever reefer madness term has been applied by the, the lazy media or by a government hopelessly out of control, we can use. But the fundamental premise is this, is that humans and individuals have rights. Humans and individuals are frail and sometimes fall prey to disease, which can engender severe pain. And, and, and treating that severe pain can end up using a number of products, which are legal and prescribed by the medical community. And in fact, as part of the human frailty, as part of the human condition that we are all part of, can become addicted to them. It's dangerous, and the government is complicit, rather than an attempt to improve or ameliorate the situation, would rather seek to criminalize people, further marginalizing them, literally putting, in many cases, their lives at risk. This is an attorney general, by my estimation, who has worked extensively over the seven years or so of his regime, and I use the term regime intentionally, to marginalize and vilify folks who use and occasionally abuse a variety of, of, of drugs. None of his programs have resulted in any increase in the quality of life by the folks who use them, by their families, or the community at large. In fact, much like the rest of the war on drugs, they've been an abject failure. This is the attorney general who fought, who fought a law which indemnified people who simply were willing to report an overdose. This is an attorney general who has aggressively worked against legalizing marijuana. This is an attorney general who saw fit to, re to eliminate any protection against a prescription medical database and allowing its use without even the benefit, if you will, of any sort of legal protection for the folks in the, the system. And now, and then perhaps the most egregious example yet, and will be explained by uh, you know, Michael Galpo, who sits to my right, we've got legislation that, it's not even worth saying what it's called, but it is aimed, again, at the user community, at the recovery community, and really the entire community. Because the people I just mentioned are part of our families, they're our friends, they're people we work with, they're people we may belong to a bowling league. It's, it's that simple. Uncles, aunts, sisters, co-workers, does it really matter? Because ultimately we're talking about human beings here. Something that this administration, whether it be the case of Governor Raimondo, I would say, hearkening back just a few years ago to her ill-fated attempt to overly tax medical cannabis, to our Attorney General, who seems hopelessly trapped in a failed 1920s era solution to a complex problem that requires input from the entire community. Tonight, we're gonna to attempt to have a number of people call in, phone in, show up. Like I said, it's an open mic. We wanna express our outrage, our condemnation, our frustration with a government that seems more intent on jailing its citizens than being any form of help whatsoever. I believe the medical code attests to the concept of do no harm. Our attorney general needs to take that advice from the medical community. So I want to take a minute to introduce, or reintroduce, I should say, Michael Gallopo. He joined us last night after the passage of this legislation. We had a little, for the first time last night, we used sort of the mobile cam. Met him on the streets of Wickenden, if you will, 
to discuss this legislation. Tonight, a day into it, a little bit rested, equally as angry, equally as upset. He's going to take a moment and actually explain the legislation, how it works, a little bit of, of what led to it, and the impact that it will have on folks' lives in the community. Michael, welcome back to the coalition. Thank you, Pat. No, thank you. You're a, you're a hero to us. I, you know, it's, it's, tonight we have people joining us who are real-life activists. Yes, they're community activists. And they come from a variety of perspectives, a variety of backgrounds, but all are dedicated to making Rhode Island a better place for all of us. Whether you agree with their perspective or not, the net result has been a community empowered, a community aware, and hopefully a community that can change things. So thanks for joining us. Take it away, and I'll join you in just a couple minutes. We've got Protect Families first here. Uh, we're going to have a couple people calling in, so we're going to try and navigate this. From a production standpoint, this probably won't be the most seamless show, but I have a feeling this is going to be one of the most powerful shows we've ever done. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. So the bill we're, we're talking about today, and I just want to put the numbers out there so you folks can go ahead and look this up online if you're interested, is uh, House Bill 7715 and Senate Bill version uh, 2279. Uh, both of these were submitted under a sub A process. And before I even get into kind of the merits and concerns of the bill, I just want to talk about the legislative process because I believe that a lot of our issues started there and really have ended there. Um, a big part of the, the process that has been very problematic um, for folks in the public health community which have been extremely proactive in trying to respond and try to do some effective lobbying and reaching the lawmakers with the, the necessary information was a hearing process where this bill was introduced and it went to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we had an extremely good turnout with the Judiciary Committee. Some concerns were expressed that were very valid, you know, backed by research, backed by you know, decades of experience and study. And so the law was held for further study. Uh, which time a few weeks had gone by and we caught wind very suddenly that a, a sub A version of the bill had been submitted and nobody had an opportunity to actually review the language of this bill uh, until the day of the revisitation of the bill by the Judiciary Committee, at which time the Judiciary Committee voted to, to move the bill forward to the floor, but with no further opportunity for debate or um, feedback or consideration for the changes that have been made to the bill. And now, this process has been criticized um, at, at some great extent uh, in other legislative efforts um, that we have found that this process where a bill can be introduced, it can be argued, and then a, a sub A, a subsequent version of that bill could then be introduced with you know, very little necessary relevance to the original version of the bill and with absolutely no opportunity for uh, further revision or public comment um, without going through extensive lobbying with legislators and having to navigate the existing power dynamics with the hope that potentially some of those power dynamics may have sufficient political will or motivation based on the evidence as presented to reconcile or further amend the bill as it's passing through the floor on the legislator. So unfortunately, what happened was a sub A version of the bill was submitted that very minimally addressed some of the concerns, but certainly not the most significant of the concerns by the public health community. An example of that. So the original bill uh, had amended the language for the drug-induced homicide law to expand an existing law under the felony murder statute, which would allow for folks who were found responsible for selling, distributing, or transmitting, and it would mean convicted of selling, dis distributing, or transmitting a drug uh, to a minor specifically, where that minor died as a result of that person's conduct. So initially the bill had sought to just simply strike the word minor, it was a very minor adaptation of, of the existing language, to then attempt to insert um, to that of a human being instead of 
that of a minor. Uh, and so it would just kind of broadly attribute this causality in the event of an untimely demise from a controlled substance, transferring possession. They struck the word convicted of and just made it for if this person was purported to have, you know, sailed or distributed or delivered. Um, and so that was what the original version looked like. And we had extensive concerns with that. Those were raised in, in an extremely lengthy, the, the last time that, that we actually came forward on this, there was about 90 solid minutes of testimony from various experts in the public health recovery and uh, activism community that were very interested in making sure that these concerns were recognized and that the merits of the bill did not outweigh the concerns in any fashion. Uh, and we felt that there was significant work to be done, if at all, a version of the bill could be presented that would be reasonably acceptable. There was a little variation of opinion on that. We had some folks that felt very strongly that some form of uh, collaboration was the necessary approach, and so really seeking to kind of mitigate the harm of the bill. And other folks that work with organizations like my own really felt that, you know, in, in obligation to the population I serve, um, there's absolutely no way that our organization could stand behind a bill that would do what this bill would do. And now I'll get into what that is. So the sub-A version of the bill that came back included some additional language, which was additionally problematic. So the first set of that language was that this law would cover any exchange of anything of value to an adult. And that is extremely broad in terms of language, let alone legal language, um, it becomes very difficult to quantify exactly what that means. Now, mind you, in the substance community, drugs themselves have monetary value inherently because they cost money to acquire. And so substances will very oftentimes be used as alternative currency, both between users to users, between people who may have some a little bit more privilege and thereby have a little bit more market share and and so it becomes another form of currency so essentially anybody who's participating in the substance use community market uh, is going to be participatory in this kind of activity it's it's inherent so the the law doesn't limit the people that it can be used to target by using that kind of language it did absolutely nothing to address those concerns so then additionally, what they did was there was a sentence of now up to life. And as we know, in our you know, criminal justice system and decades of research on you know, sentencing guidelines and the way that you know, judicial discretion plays out in the courtroom and how the outcomes are very much divided along racial and class lines. And the same is true for our arrest data. Uh, in, our, in our recent study from January through March of 2018, the folks who would be convicted under the 21-4.08-A2A uh, and A2B, so the possession with intent to distribute controlled substances form of their, their judicial code that governs criminal law and has the sentencing guidelines and, and um, kind of the prosecuting criteria for the crimes that would be culpable under this law. Uh, in this data study, we, sh we were able to show that 94% of the people who were arrested for this kind of crime were exclusively from the most poorest communities in the state of Rhode Island. Additionally, that folks who identified as both black and Hispanic were arrested at 12 and a third times their presence in the community. So this is Providence residents data correlated to Providence arrests, nothing further. Same thing, when we talk about black alone and Hispanic alone, while Providence is a very diverse community, those numbers are significantly higher than in other parts of the state. Folks from those communities were still being arrested at two and a half times their represent, representation in the community. And so the way that this law would be used and the way the people that it targets um, are mostly folks and overwhelmingly folks from poor communities of color. And those are the people that wind up bearing the burden of this kind of legislation. Additionally, the sentencing guidelines usually have a heavier impact on the underprivileged 
Uh, public defenders do not have the resources that private attorneys do to be able to pursue additional action and look at other ways to, to move through a, a potentially a defense process uh, to prepare people for trial. And so it's very, very difficult for uh, folks who are in the underprivileged class to be able to walk away from these occurrences uh, with a reasonable outcome. Uh, the other thing that it does is it significantly advances the sentencing benchmarks, which is a drastic departure from the, uh, the existing um, act that we have that commits us, this, the Justice Reinvestment Act commits us to maintaining the existing uh, sentencing benchmarks that are out there. In fact, even at the federal level, the life sentence benchmark that's out there has language that requires prior conviction and persistent offender written into their language of the federal sentencing guidelines. And they only govern trafficking activities that are above a certain level where products are crossing state lines. And so kind of counterintuitively, what the attorney general was saying that they were hoping to accomplish with this law actually shows quite clearly that it's not even within their jurisdiction to be able to do. What I mean by that is what I say um, the presence of fentanyl and what they were going after were going after these distributors of fentanyl, the manufacturers that are inserting fentanyl into our supply, that they could not do because the second that those supplies are crossing state lines, it is now exclusively in the jurisdiction of the federal government. So what this does do is it does increase criminalization drastically for folks at the street level and for poor communities of color and it creates a significantly increased cost burden for all of the residents of the state of Rhode Island. These are resources that we sorely need for all different kinds of programming that we know works against addiction in our communities, right? So addressing childhood trauma and providing supportive services, being able to provide treatment on demand so when people are ready to enter recovery, they can access the necessary supports and resources to do that, affordable housing, living wage jobs, right? And so the list goes on and on and on. We're not prioritizing our very scarce resources to do these things when we are making very long-term permanent commitments to increasing criminalization. So in just a very short, easy to grab onto phrase, what this law does is simple. It fills our prisons with a sense of permanence and it furthers the prison industrial complex that we have here in the state of Rhode Island. And we frankly cannot afford to do this. The other thing that it does that is significant is that it will increase the amount of fear that exists within communities of use across the state. And so as much as we really would like, and we have worked hard to get people to utilize the Good Samaritan Law and to contact 911 in the event of an emergency and to carry naloxone with them and use with a friend, the fear that that friend or somebody else who's close to them, potentially a distributor or a partner, somebody who's within their community that they have a deep interpersonal relationship with could potentially go to prison for life would cause those people to say, I'm not comfortable with you saving my life if it means that somebody else's life will be lost as a result. And that is an unfair level of decision making that we ask people who are extremely vulnerable to make when our priority here is to save lives. So what the law doesn't do is it doesn't do that. It doesn't save lives. We live in an era of distribution that operates at a conglomerate level. The insertion and the emergence of fentanyl. Fentanyl is a drug unlike any other opiate before it that does not have to come from a sourced crop. It is completely and utterly engineered in a laboratory setting. And so it is much more difficult to track down sourcing and production. And the establishment of multiple, numerous, diverse production facilities in any area is almost completely, fully untraceable. We also have the existence of a black market exchange through our internet that people can utilize to access illicit substances virtually anywhere in the country at a moment's notice, where the actors change day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, and the amount of resources that it takes for us to investigate these people, for us to track down these people, for us to bust these pop-up labs, and then 
litigate people, bring them through prosecution, pay for them to sit in prison for life. We just frankly can't afford to do this to an immeasurable amount of people. It's just not sensible. So the real question at the root of this is, why do people buy these drugs if they're dangerous? And the answer is simple. Because there is a demand. And we have failed as a society to find a sensible and reasonable way to meet that demand in a way that we know can keep people safe. This is literally the only industry remaining in America where we have failed to provide basic consumer product safety protections for people who are consuming products. We know that this has worked in every single other industry that we have. It is mind blowing that instead of doing these things that we know work, that require a very small investment, that instead we invest millions upon millions of dollars in warehousing vulnerable people. And what else this law will do is it will also ensure that those people who are now being arrested for a violent crime are kept further from reintegrating into society when they return. So now as a victim of a violent crime, that person's family can now be held civilly liable and they can be sued for an untimely demise. That person's family who now has to go without their support, potentially for life, is now on the hook financially. And so now they really have to try to overcome not only the additional barrier of losing their loved one, the trauma that subsequently is experienced by those children, but now there's a significant financial barrier on top of that. Additionally, that person is now branded a violent criminal, and under our current access, right, to financial aid, that person, which otherwise is only a substance-related crime, could get waived by going into treatment and it be able to access secondary, post-secondary education opportunities so then they're re, you know, reintegrate into society. That is my story. Because I was convicted of multiple distribution crimes. I rehabilitated, I went through treatment, I got into college, and I graduated at the top of my class from an accredited school of social work. For people under this law, with this law on our books, those opportunities are gone forever. So if we really hope for our communities to heal and to get better, then I really hope that we think long and hard about what we're doing because this is not the way for us to do that. Thank you so much. We're going to take a very quick break right now. We're going to try and get Stephen Brown from the <clears throat> American Civil Liberties Union on the phone. Steve is doing yeoman's work right now, uh, engaged, if you will, up at Halitosius Hall. So we've asked him to dial in when he's got a second. Folks, you are listening, as always, to The Coalition on the Worldwide Coalition Media Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center. 90 Wave off the street in the heart of the city we love. This is Pride Week. Let me talk a little bit about that for a second while we're transitioning here. This is one of the great weeks of the year to be in Providence. I am so looking forward to uh, tomorrow evening's festivities. The Libertarian Party of Rhode Island will be marching. Go to lpri.us or facebook.com, the LP of F, LP of RI, if you'd like to join us. It's sort of a, we're taking sort of a New Orleans approach in honor of our national convention in a couple weeks in New Orleans. We, uh, New Orleans parade, people just sort of join in as they go along and celebrate life. And that's what the community is doing this weekend. You know, for the first time last night, we did a little bit of broadcasting from the streets of Providence, something I want to do often. We interviewed Ashley Delgado, who is the uh, Grand Marshal of the parade. And we introduced and interviewed folks who are involved with the Pride organizing efforts from their organizing meeting in downtown Providence last night. We're going to do some of that tomorrow as well, interviews on the streets. You'll see pop up from time to time on Facebook. I'll give you an opportunity. All you have to do is click and listen live, and we're going to bring some of the most interesting thought leaders in Providence to you during the day, at times from testimony, at times from just chance encounters. It's all about communicating and bringing the community together. That is the point of the coalition. So we're going to take a very quick break for now. Let me list over the websites. Coalitionradio.us is the mothership. These and all other shows live in perpetuity at the Coalition Radio. 
Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio, where you'll see ongoing lists of events. Our Muddy Muddy Twitter account at Coalition underscore radio. And of course, at Pawtucket is home, our all apolitical billionaire baseball boys club Twitter feed. I guess they're coming back out of the bathtub again next week. Rumors are abounding about all sorts of developments in, 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 up in Worcester. People in Worcester are breathless, breathless, if you will, with the opportunity to give away millions of dollars to billionaires in form of corporate welfare. Stay tuned for this and more as we discuss last night's legislation, and we ask you to reach out to Governor Raimondo and say no. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. And we are back. We are the Coalition, loud and proud. Joining us in a rare break this evening is uh, someone that we admire greatly here at the Coalition. Of course, I'm talking about Stephen Brown from the Rhode Island chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, Stephen, thank you for joining us. I know you're, you're slammed, so let's, let's get right to it. Legislation was passed last night where if you were to listen to some of the testimony, the, the immortal words, if we can get one more drug dealer off the street, that somehow this will be good and we could save one life. Um, you know, Michael Gallopo is here in studio, and he just went through an extensive analysis of the legislation. Um, you know, when you hear that, one must ask, what could possibly be wrong with that? How noble is that? Stephen, from the American Civil Liberties Union perspective, what exactly is wrong with this legislation? Well, there are a lot of things wrong with it, and my guess is Michael uh, has hit a, a lot of the high spots on it. Mm -hmm. But the, the first thing is it, it really is not going to in any way uh, help fully address the opioid crisis. Um, it is much more likely to harm people. Um, it is, its goal from the beginning, we've been told, is to get drug kingpins. And yet, um, when, the, when they debated this and voted on it yesterday, the House actually defeated some amendments that were designed to make sure that it did just that. And I think by defeating those amendments, uh, the the motivation behind this became became clear, which is it's not designed to get at drug kingpins. Um, its focus will ultimately be on 
you know, low-hanging fruit, if I can use that term. Um, you know, people who have uh, drug addictions, um, who um, uh, who are easy to to charge if they happen to be with a friend or a family member um, who tragically dies as a result of drugs that they bought from somewhere, having no idea whatsoever um, that it might be laced with you know fentanyl or, or some other deadly substance. Um, it's not in any way going to get a drug uh, a drug kingpin. Um, it will, uh, I think, uh, create some more fear in in um, the community of users in in not picking up the phone uh, when there's an emergency taking place uh, because it really uh, you know they're really at the mercy of of the police at that point as to whether they will uh, be deemed to qualify under uh, under some of the language in the bill. You know, part of the debate subject uh, centered around the notion that. The language was established so that if someone exchanges drugs, that somehow that would give them some type of immunity from prosecution. First of all, how tenuous is that language? And in reality, how does that play out on the streets? Well, it's very tenuous. Um, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the proposed amendments, which would not in any way have actually made the bill um, good for, uh, it would have made the bill a little better, um, was to make clear that um, it, it, invo- it required profit, um, that um, you know the person was involved in selling the particular drug involved for profit. You know this idea of of, of dealing with uh, addressing the situation of people who share drugs. I mean that's fine as far as it goes. It just doesn't go very far at all. You have um, you know a drug user you know paying some money to the friend to go purchase the drugs off the street. You have um, you have friends uh, trading other things. You know, you can stay here for the night if you you know if you give me some drugs. None of these things are covered by that amendment that was uh, that was put into the bill. So there there are a whole range of circumstances where uh, individuals who again are themselves users um, with another user that language is not going to help uh, protect them. From being charged with murder under under this um, under this bill, I had a question, Steve, and just a little bit of follow up. Is there a legal definition for the word sharer? Because that was the first time I've ever seen that word used in a bill. No, uh, I mean, the the bill itself has no uh, definitions at all, and you know it certainly will be ripe for discussion and debate. What you know, what does it mean sharing? Um, sharing a substance, and I don't have the answer to that. My fear, Stephen, is we're, we're creating a legal climate in this, in this country, both on a national and a local basis, where folks who, in good faith, are, you know, on a personal level, are in- involving themselves in a variety of challenge environments. It could be someone who is a sex worker, someone who is uh, utilizing drugs, someone who is, you know, clearly in the, in the gray areas of, of law enforcement. And, and so by becoming engaged in support services, whether it be through a formal organization or just simply through a family connection, we're putting these people at inordinate risk. I, I just, I don't under, and I'm, of course I'm talking about FOSTA and SESTA, something we'll get into later in the show, but is, is, am, I, am I wrong to be suspicious of this, this new wave? And in, in what is, again, from, from law enforcement's perspective, why this uh, un- relentless attack on people who are challenged? I, it, it's, it's striking how that, that they, these folks who are marginalized are being put into increasingly dangerous situations by law enforcement and the government that purports to help them. Uh, you're absolutely right. And keep in mind, you know, this, you know, this bill was generated by a tragic death, a, a young woman uh, who died after, um, get, uh, you know, Purchasing drugs from from a dealer, but that person ended up getting charged and convicted, and and a forty and, and um, a forty year sentence handed down. Mm-hmm. So you know, so there already are things in place. So then the question does become, you know, why this bill? And it is, I think, to get as you say at at the marginalized, um, uh, and you know, that's what's that's what's so troubling. You know, there. There was a letter that that Michael uh, may have mentioned, uh, signed by, you know, every major medical professional group, um, reco- the recovery community, the Rhode Island Medical Society, 
you know, there were 70 plus signatories to this letter for people it directly involved in dealing with this crisis on a daily basis, mm-hmm. all saying this bill is bad. It won't help. It will hurt. Um, and that should have been the end of the story. You know, when you see a letter like that, when you see all the signatories, it's just incredible that these lawmakers would completely ignore the pleas from the people who were dealing with this issue and say, well, we don't care what they say, we don't believe what they say, we're going to pass this bill. That's, that's the worst part of it, really. It's not that they were operating out of ignorance in passing this bill. They were rejecting the, this very clear message from the medical community that this was a bad bill. Right, and I want to point out two people who were strenuous with their objections. One of them has joined us in the past with you, Stephen. And, of course, that's Steve DeToy of the Rhode Island Medical Society, um, who is author and will be sharing with, uh, you know, viewers, readers, listeners, and actually all of Rhode Island this weekend, the letter that he penned. And we're also, you know, the most recent prominent health department head, and, of course, we're talking about Dr. Fine, uh, who also came out and, and, and objected strenuously to this, to this legislation. And so we're talking about a unique bipartisan uh, attack that came across that was multidisciplinary from the legal, the medical community, as well as the uh, support and caregiver community here in the state. Um, what's, what's astonishing is that the, the legislation that comes out of you know, Smith Hill seems routinely to be one of the most unifying factors in our state because whether it be the prescription medical database, which you were kind enough to join us in attacking last year, you know, the warrantless searches of that, now on to this, now on to any one of a number of laws, it seems like the one thing that brings this together, the state together is bad criminal law being enforced by an out-of-control state government. But that's my opinion. Um, Stephen, you know, in, in, in clo- and again, we appreciate your time. Joining us right now is Stephen Brown from the Rhode Island chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, who has been stalwart both in rejecting, uh, rejecting this legislation, has been had great efforts in bringing together coalitions of people to reject it, and at the same time, equally as important, has been working diligently to inform the public as to what's going on, and sometimes that's the biggest challenge of all, as we know. Uh, you know, it, it's pa- been passed by the Senate, it's been passed by the House. I'm assuming those are partner legislation. It's, it, I, I assume it's going to Governor Raimondo's uh, desk. Is she the last stop on this train? Is this the last hope is to get her to veto this? Yeah, I mean, there's still the, the bills still need to cross over. The House and Senate still okay. need to vote on each other's bills. You know, that will be pretty pro forma sometime next week. So yes, we're you know the the the, the next the next real stop and the last stop is the governor. Uh, the buck does stop there. Um, we and other groups are continuing to urge her to veto the bill, even though she has been um, publicly quoted as saying that um, she will sign the legislation. Um, we don't think it's over, and I, it's important that people who care about this should call or email uh, the governor's office and and express their their objections to it and urge her to veto this bill. It's uh, it, it ultimately is in her hands. Um, you know, she's you know done a lot of things to uh, try to treat uh, the opioid epidemic here as a public health crisis rather than a criminal matter. But this is a big step backward and. You know, I, I think she needs to hear from the public that it's that, that sort of step backward. Right. And if these type of efforts are left unchecked, we will continue to lose civil liberties. We will continue to marginalize the challenge. And we will continue to decline, really, as a society here in Rhode Island, um, as, as the few protections left against any one of a variety should crumble before us. And, and quite frankly, it's up to us. When you have organizations like Michael's and Stevens working so aggressively to make you informed as a citizen, it's up to us to, well, to, to take that knowledge and run with it and, and to work with it, in this case, working hard. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. I know this is, this is your Super Bowl, World Series, Final Four, all wrapped up into one right now. <laughs> um, you know, and, and the madness will continue. When does the session actually end? Or does the Rhode Island legislature ever actually really go away? <laughs> uh, well, they're they're trying to wrap up uh, by the end of next week. Uh, whether that actually happens remains to be seen. Right. Well, again, Stephen, thank you so very much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Of course, that's Stephen Brown from your Rhode Island American Civil Liberties Union.
One need only go to the top of coalitionradio.us where there will be a link to one of my favorite coalition interviews of all time, why you need to join the ACLU. And it was done when it was coalition version 1.0 when we resided on WPRO in an analog world. We're going to take a very quick break right now, literally a passing of the guard for about 20 seconds. Anna Jane Yelkin from Protect Rhode Island Families, or I always get this mixed up, tell me the <laughs> Protect Families First of Rhode Island, okay, is going to be joining us. Uh, that organization is no stranger to the coalition. They are working aggressively within the community to provide services, solutions, support to folks who are, find themselves and their families involved in, uh, in challenged situations, if you will, whether it be uh, folks who have been incarcerated, uh, folks who are challenged by issues like opioid abuse. Uh, it's a wonderful organization. They deserve your support. She's going to join us to, A, tell us a little bit more about the organization, and B, give us her rather unique street-level perspective, as did Michael, on one of the most challenging, if not the largest, public health crisis facing America today. We are the Coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media, broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Media Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center. CoalitionRadio.us, Facebook.com, slash the Coalition Radio, and of course on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio. Stay tuned. It's going to be a quick changing of the guard. Folks, we need you to be outraged. We need you to get involved. We need your voice to be heard. Stay tuned. We'll literally be right back. And we are back. We are the Coalition Loud and Proud. We've got a special programming on for tonight. It's kind of an open mic. We've asked folks who are involved in a variety of uh, ways with folks who are challenged by opioid abuse to join us tonight in reaction to last night's legislation as passed by your State House of Representatives. We just heard from Stephen Brown, the director of the Rhode Island American Civil Liberties Union chapter. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's... It's brought together folks who are from a variety of disciplines. Uh, later on in the show, he, uh, Steve DeToy, who's the head of the Rhode Island, or sorry, the public relations person and spokesman for the Rhode Island Medical Association, is going to be joining us, uh, we hope, by phone. Uh, this caught a lot of people, not by surprise. I think we realized that it was probably going to pass. I'm not sure that we thought it was going to pass, uh, pass by the substantial majority. There is a hall of shame that the coalition will be publishing later on today. That'll be a reflection of our attitudes. We're very careful, by the way, when our guests come on, not to attempt to put them in a politically compromising position or to speak on their behalf. Uh, so that's why we reserve a lot of the judgment and a lot of the outrage porn that you'll hear on the conventional major media. The other issue is, on a night like tonight, is that we're able to focus the time necessary to develop arguments, discussions, facts that mainstream media simply can't support. What we're doing here is spending a couple hours on a complex subject that really takes should take weeks, months, years to discuss. But it's quite frankly, it's a lot better than the 30-second treatment it gets on any one of the major television stations. No discredit to them. That format is not developed for really thought-provoking news or discussion of issues. Independent media is. And that's why Rhode Islanders should be proud that we have one of the strongest indie media networks, uh, really, I think, in New England. Whether it be Tony Jones, my good friend Steve Alquist, uh, across the board here at the Coalition, and even here at the mothership, which is, despite its growing size, is actually one of the godfathers of indie media in the state. Of course, I'm talking about uh, 
golocalprov.com. Uh, joining me for the first time is Anna Jane Yolkin. Uh, I always, and I apologize ahead of time, I always stumble and bumble, I have a mental block about saying your company name first, if you will, but it's Protect Families First of Rhode Island? Just Protect Families First. Protect Families First. Yep. Okay. Um, Protect Families First is no stranger to this show. Uh, folks who, uh, good friends of ours of the show, who are formerly involved now have, have moved on and are engaged in well, other community activities. Uh, Anna Jane joins us for the first time. And so tell us a little bit about yourself. We've got some time here. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about the organization. Yeah, thank you so much, Pat. I'm really excited to be here and to talk more about this really important issue, which I think more people should know about because it does affect so many people and it's important for people to be engaged. So um, Protect Families First is a local nonprofit. We advocate for drug policies and practices that promote community health and safety, keep families intact, you know, keep people out of prison, right, when they don't need to be in prison, um, and prevent overdose deaths. And we really work at the intersection of public health and criminal justice reform efforts to address um, the opioid epidemic, the overdose epidemic, um, substance abuse in general, but most importantly to undo our failed drug policies that we have in this country. We have decades of evidence that shows that warehousing people in prison for their substance use does not work. Um, it's expensive, it's costly, it rips families apart, and we need better solutions. So that's what we work for. Excellent. And what, what's your background? Yeah, so I'm a public health professional by training. Um, I have my master's in public health from Harvard. I studied socio-epidemiology, but I'm also an activist, right? So I bring both those lens of being an activist, an advocate, and also a public health background to try and address this problem um, with the immediacy and with the research and with the thought that it deserves. Absolutely. And we yeah. celebrate activists here. Regardless of your political stripe, it's, it's activists that have made this community as vibrant as it is today yeah. and overcome a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the challenges that both our government and the folks who would purport to govern us uh, particularly seem to per perpetrate upon us. Um, let's step back for a second. Yeah. The community you service, mm -hmm. uh, how prominent is substance abuse and addiction within the community that you work with? Yeah, I'd say that um, substance abuse or drug use that doesn't, that isn't problematic is very common. Um, you know, everyone's one or two steps away from knowing someone who is directly affected if people aren't directly affected themselves. Um, I work with people who are in prison. I work with loved ones who have family members in prison for their substance use. Um, and it's very common and it's becoming more apparent now that the face of drug use is changing and becoming whiter and going towards the um, suburban community. However, this is a systemic problem. It's always existed and we need to continue working towards proactive solutions. And, and, and so in your mind, if you were to uh, give a report card grade for the war on drugs, as it's affected yeah. the local communities that you've worked with intimately yeah. now, F. Is it yeah. helpful in any way? I, I don't see any effects, any positive effects of the war on drugs, and I think there is consensus, growing consensus, that our drug policies have not worked. Um, I was recently in Portugal, which is a whole country that decriminalized drug possession, right? So anyone who is found with substances on them up to a 10-day supply gets diverted into an administrative process that directs people either towards treatment or towards community service, towards supportive efforts. And they've seen their drug use, their substance um, abuse rates, and also their overdose death rates plummet. And I think that's something that we need to learn from. There are other models of ways of doing this, and clearly the war on drugs is not it's only filling prisons, right? Right. Yeah. And, and let's let's talk about some of the, um, I'll call it the aftershocks of the war. Yeah. You know, if, if folks complain, uh, particularly from the political right, about, um, about immigration mm -hmm. and folks fleeing other countries to come here, uh, understand that when you engage in a prohibition society, you ultimately don't reduce demand mm -hmm. very much, yep. if sometimes... Not at all. Sometimes you increase demand, mm -hmm. given the prurient nature, if you will, of whatever you're, you're engaged in in prohibition of. So ultimately, the source can't be local. The source has to be elsewhere. It has to be underground. Mm -hmm. And underground prohibition societies, whether it be you know the result of the Volstead Act in the 1920s with alcohol or whether it be cannabis and, and drugs here in the, in the 21st century, are, are derived from elsewhere in a gangster uh, black market environment for whom the currency is either cash or violence. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done here is we import 
our drugs and we export our violence. And that violence is a, is a singular cause or a significant part of the immigration, if you will, from Latin American countries who are, you know, people are fleeing to be blunt, narco-terrorism. Narco-terrorism that is directly attributable to the way that we consume drugs here in the United States. It's really that simple. And so you've got multiple layers of health crises being created because we are too selfish, too self-absorbed to recognize that the use of drugs, like any prohibitive project, is going to continue. And so we, we export our violence to them. So that's one reaction. Number two, you've got broken families across the country. Um, you've got a, a clearly highly uneven levels of law enforcement. Uh, where law enforcement, whether it be stop and frisk or any one of a number of egregious activities, which are a clear violation of something called the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment, um, <laughs> you know, go figure, yeah. don't occur in, 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 in leafy suburbs or in, in the halls of the Ivy League. No, they occur in the inner city because, quite frankly, those folks are marginalized, they're easier to target, and the underground economy is more likely to flourish there. So we've created this, this battleground, if you will, literal, between, uh, between folks in communities that are challenged and impaired and marginalized and law enforcement. Uh, I understand it, and that and two analyses were done of the riots in Ferguson. Number one was what happened during the riots. Far less publicized what was happened in the run-up to the riots and the economy that was created by law enforcement's ag aggressive interpretation, selective as it was, of uh, of, of drug laws within a challenged community and who, who looked at those communities literally as ATM machines mm -hmm. for, for their own government and for their own increased militarization of the police. So, yeah. so the, the, the after effects of the war on drugs are staggering. Yeah. And to add one thing to your first point, Pat, there's something called the Iron Law of Prohibition. And mm -hmm. what this says is that when prohibition exists, there will be economic forces that cause, cause more potent and more dangerous drugs. And this happened during alcohol prohibition. Mm -hmm. People during alcohol prohibition, they didn't drink beer or wine. Why would you drink beer or wine when you know you had to smuggle something? Instead, people drank moonshine, they drank whiskey, people became blind, right? And I think that's what we're seeing now with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a really potent opioid. It can be very dangerous. Um, you know, it's basically prolific um, in the drug supply in Rhode Island. And I'd say that similar market forces of prohibition have caused fentanyl to be so prevalent because it's so potent, it's so easy to smuggle, and there is so much demand for it. So that demand will be met with supply. Right, and ultimately when you have, when consumer markets aren't allowed to process any good or services, that good or services becomes bastardized in an attempt to increase profit margins. And yeah. clearly, the chemical additives to so any one or a number of forms of illicit, illicit drugs, all right, increase profit margins, put people at risk. So you have the actual, the perverse reality that d criminalizing drugs makes them less safe and puts entire communities at risk. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's worked out well, yeah. hasn't it? <laughs> Not so much. Not so much. So now you've got an entire segment of the first responder community which has to routinely, res if you will, address overdoses. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's clearly been exacerbated by the overprescription, if you will, of opiates, mm -hmm. some of which and we don't have clear research because cannabis is scheduled by the DEA in the same context that far more dangerous drugs are. And so we've never been able to properly research, uh, because of that federal prohibition, whether or not cannabis and its variety of forms can be used as, as, as at least somewhat of a substitute for modifying pain. Yeah. So you have, and it's the most cliche thing to say in the media, but when you wrap that all up, you truly have the perfect storm. Absolutely. You have government being twisted around by individuals with their own perspectives, I'm going to be kind here, who are ultimately causing more harm than the very issues that they, su they seek to suppress. Yeah, absolutely. How's that working out for us? Not working out so well. What do you, what do you see? You're, you're, yeah. you're working directly with families, and, and I, I, I want to stress that for a second, because the folks who are here tonight are individuals who... Don't discuss this from the, the confines of, of their laptop computers at home. Um, they're not keyboard warriors. They don't sit on talk radio shows. And I love talk, I'm a creature of talk radio. But they don't talk on, uh, on talk radio shows and opine from this perfect little world they think they inhabit. Uh, a newsflash to a lot of folks 
You may think you have a severe autocratic response to folks who, who, who use and abuse drugs, but I will tell you that on statistics, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that a significant number of you have folks in your own family who are using them, and you just don't realize it. You don't have that level of control you have. So the, you're seeing this literally at the kitchen tables of people across Providence who have to rebuild or try to hold together their families as they crumble around them. So, so, uh, you know, I'm not one for sensationalization, but what, what are you seeing these individual families being subjected to you know, as this crisis just continues to blow up? Yeah, I mean, there's still so much stigma, right? There's still so, people, there's so much fear of talking about this. And I think we could get somewhere if we talked about this and talked about it honestly, right? <laughs> and I also feel like there's so much, um, yeah, there's so much, there's so much misinformation out there. There's mm -hmm. so much, you know, oh, there's just no, there's no evidence base of how to, how to effectively work with families. There is an evidence base, but what were, what the messages that are still being told, you know, oh, people have to hit rock bottom, oh, it's tough love. Oh, you know, force people, coerce people into doing things are still the common themes, and those are not things that have been shown to be effective, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I think that despite how prevalent this is, there's still not, there, people still aren't taking appropriate approaches. Right. And I, and I want to get into that. Yeah. We're going to have this sort of rotating cast. Yeah, uh, yeah. We've got uh, Paul DeVores just joined us, and I want to get him in for a few minutes because sure. I know he's getting pulled around. Yeah. But when, it, when we come back to you in a little bit, I want to talk about, rather than just bang away at, at, at a sense of negativity, and there's, there's, I get a sense of sort of doom and gloom right now in, in, a, in a lot of activists because of some of the things that have happened in the session. But I also want to stress from your, your, your professional perspective as someone who is immersed in the issue on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not sitting in a library or lab somewhere analyzing statistics. You're immersed in this, but at the same time, you, you have got the credentials professionally that can, can really reflect on what we need to do mm -hmm. positively. What, what is it the community has to do after we somehow find a way to get this bill vetoed? Mm -hmm. Sounds like a plan? Sounds like a plan. All right, I'll awesome. talk, to you in a, talk to you in a few minutes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Jabor to come in. Thank you so much. Yeah. Folks, we're just gonna, we're not even gonna, we're not even gonna turn off. We're just gonna hang in there for a second. Uh, we've got a special guest who took some time, despite the craziest week of the year for him, and he's gonna join us in just a second. And we're back. Joining us for the first time, uh, an individual who uh, spoke courageously against us and at the same time is immersed in the most challenging part of the legislative calendar is Senator Paul Javor. Uh, thank you for joining us. We, we've never formally met until tonight, although you and I have spent quality time together. I refer to Thursday nights at this time of the year. Um, there's a meeting room at the end of the, I believe it's the second floor, and it's where Senate Judiciary hangs out and kind of chills. And um, that's kind of my favorite place to go because I get off work early on Thursdays and it's kind of like cheers to me. I go to meetings and I see <laughs> what's up with judiciary because while the rest of the state this week is obsessing about House and Senate finance, quite frankly, the Senate Judiciary, I believe, is the other most important uh, organization in government because this is, where, this is where your civil rights either live or die, depending on who's promoting what or where. And, uh, and, I, and I thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you clearly uh, have a take on this, if you will. Um, tell me about your experience with the legislation, where you stand, and as importantly, where, what we need to do now that it's passed the Senate. 
So as you know, and uh, I do appreciate individuals like you who spend countless hours late in the evening um, at Senate Judiciary Committee. I've been a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee now uh, for 10 years. Um, it is a very important committee. It's a committee that uh, frames much of the judicial code, the, the laws that uh, deal with people and uh, people that become part of, unfortunately, the criminal system. Uh, and uh, if we can just go back two years, we did a major legislative overhaul in which we passed the Justice Reinvestment Commission Act. Mm -hmm. That was an act that was passed after much discussion and meetings with attorneys judges, court personnel, uh, various community stakeholders, individuals concerned about uh, the uh, system that we have in place, not just the judicial system, but also our prison system, how we incarcerate individuals, how we penalize individuals, what type of parole system do we have here in the state of Rhode Island, and what type of supportive services, both at a pretrial level and then one who may be paroled at a later date, what type of support services mm -hmm. we have. So Rhode Island made a commitment a couple of years ago, the legislature did, although Judiciary Committee was the committee that ultimately passed that bill, right. sent that to the Senate floor. Mm -hmm. There was a companion bill on the House side, went through House Judiciary, and that passed. So. When this particular bill that was introduced in the Senate and in the House, I guess the, the reaction to it was an Attorney General's bill. It was actually submitted by the Attorney General, Bill Martin, sponsored by Senator Gallo, who I think had good intentions with the sponsorship of the bill. But the, the way the bill was drafted, its, it's legislative intent, and the end result of, of the passage of this bill is clearly not in line with not only the Justice Reinvestment Commission, but I really don't think that it really accomplishes a whole lot other mm -hmm. than place someone in jail for life as a result of, of an act that may be, may be unintentional. I, mm -hmm. I don't even think that in some instances the individual who will be charged under this statute is someone that should even be facing a life sentence. So um, what can we do at this point? It passed the House mm -hmm. um, last evening. The Senate version passed the Senate about a week ago. Um, the Senate vote was 22 to 12, I believe. Um, so 33 members, a third of the membership didn't agree with it. The Senate has 38 members, right. five did not vote. On the House side last night, I think it was a 55 to 14 vote. Mm -hmm. So a smaller percentage of House members opposed it, which was a bit surprising to me. Although the bill on the s House side was the sponsorship of the Speaker. Speaker right. Mattiello was the mm -hmm. sponsor of that bill. I believe that the young woman who died of the tragic overdose um, resided in the Speaker's district. Right. Um, the governor now holds the cards by way of whether or not the governor mm -hmm. could veto the bill or just not act on it, and then obviously it would pass and become law. Right. You know, going back to the commission that Senate Judiciary had gone through, I walked away from that, and, and I was, you know, I, I'll never pretend, uh, profess to be an expert. I literally play one on the radio. Uh, my sense was that, you know, communities on an economic level often come across with an economic blueprint, a model, a, a development plan. And my sense, my takeaway from a couple of years ago was that you folks had engaged in, in a very thoughtful process to come up with an approach and a plan that you had actually taken the time to, to step back and, and, and gain perspective on how the entire system worked. Absolutely. All right, and it became clear to me, and, and this became an issue during the revival of the Good Samaritan Law, Correct. that the state was finally going to take a, a healthy perspective on issues uh, like recovery and addiction. That we'd grown up as a society and we wished to move people away 
from the embarrassment, the shame, the vilification, and create an environment where people would feel more comfortable coming to terms with themselves and addressing their own personal health issues without fear of becoming entangled in the legal system. Now, you're, you're an attorney, correct? Yes, I am. All right, so, you know, anyone who's ever gotten, and I'll use the term ensnared, and that's unfair in a sense, who's become involved in the legal system on the wrong end can attest to just how difficult it is to pull yourself back out of that. And to see issues like addiction and, and, and recovery become the slope by which you fall back into that system. Because let's be honest, despite the efforts of government, we're, it's going to be years before we can, we can create an environment where people can recover, pay their quote unquote dues to society, and then build constructive laws. There's still um, shame involved, there's still institutional challenges in becoming employed, and in all sorts of areas that need work. There still remains a stigma no matter what we what we try to pass, right. what we create, right. there is a stigma. I think what's surprising is that not only is this sort of go against, this piece of legislation go against the act, but mm -hmm. um, we have various programs. For example, um, an individual who uh, has uh, been charged with the crime. Rhode Island is at the forefront. We have a drug court, for example, here mm -hmm. in Rhode Island. It's an excellent program. Right. You talk about the recovery process. It offers an individual a chance to get away from a criminal record, right. complete the process of mm -hmm. a total rehabilitation as ordered by the court, right. the program itself. Graduate from that program, have the record Mm -hmm. expunged and removed as if it had never mm -hmm. actually occurred. Right. Person moves on, and there are many people who have gone through that program. What did? What was the next step? Beyond the issue of drugs, we would then begin to deal with the issue of mental health and alcohol. Right. We expanded that program. Mm -hmm. The drug court now includes individuals who have mental health issues and right. alcohol issues. Mm -hmm. So now we're playing with three factors here. Mm -hmm. And in the recovery phase, this is where we need to begin to look at, in a full view, the opioid, the alcohol, and the mental health, and how it all does come together. Right. Um, so when we get a bill, for example, like the one we just passed in the Senate and just passed in the House, and we look at it and we say, someone's going to get life, that may be the person's first contact with the law. Right. It may be an unfortunate situation that involves the way the actual law is written is that you could have someone that it just says there was an exchange between two individuals for value, mm -hmm. something of value. Mm -hmm. And if it's a transaction that involves a drug that becomes lethal to the individual who took it, mm -hmm. the person is facing life. Uh, one of my arguments was that on the Senate floor, which I think was bit persuasive to a number of members is that number one, first of all, we have to look at what our programs are and we ought to be spending more time working with the recovery, the addiction recovery community, number one. Mm -hmm. More programs, more investment. In fact, there was a, an article that was written and sent to the legislators by Dr. Fine, who was right. the former director of health here. In the, in the state, and Dr. Fine laid out a very sound argument, which part of my argument included that, that these are some of the issues that we should deal with. Um, the other issue, I think, is that when we look at what the penalty is here, and we're talking about putting somebody away for life, um, the question becomes, what are we really accomplishing with such a, a, a harsh, sentence mm -hmm. and I don't think we accomplish anything to that individual who who would be a low-level drug dealer maybe someone who for the first time was involved in the sale of a drug and the way the statute is written it may not even be the traditional drug deal that, that law enforcement may may portray to a court in a criminal complaint I think we have all these images of the French Connection taking place in downtown Providence. Are you, uh, that's not the case here. And right. the bills shouldn't be something that's dealing with the French Connection. But my concern was that uh, are we not, if it's an attorney general in the state of Rhode Island, looking to target 
a drug problem by way of distribution, then we need to go up a couple of levels. And what we need to do is look in the middle mm -hmm. where the people who are making this stuff, as they call them, the chefs or the chemists, right. or people that are on a higher level. Now, where has um, the destruction of the individual come from taking of the drug? Obviously, it's the strength in the, in, in the drug that is, that is on the street now has a level. There's a level. All, all of what seems right now from what I've read is the, the fentanyl that's involved in the mixture mm -hmm. is coming from China. That, that's, that's where it appears to be. Some of the government reports, some of this stuff comes from China. Mm -hmm. Some of the dosages are given to, I'll give you an example, uh, an elephant or a horse for certain types of medical treatment. Mm -hmm. a, a human being taking what a horse or an animal would mm -hmm. ingest, you're lucky if you'll survive 10 minutes after ingesting that. Mm -hmm. The people who are making this stuff in the labs, who are working in the middle or the upper tier, the low level, I'll use the term mule, they have no idea what the composition is of mm -hmm. that drug that's being given, right. even if it's an innocent transaction to a friend. And, and how many times, I'll call it our, and, and this is the frustration, the system creates what I call survival drug sales, just Correct. like the system creates survival sex sales. And in survival drug sales, you've got folks looking to feed their habit by profiting at the very bottom of the food chain, Absolutely. all right, in order to skim off their own supply. And, and if we could take a, a moment to remark on human frailty, it's almost cliche, but so many opioid addicts are literally a bad car wreck or a broken leg or some type of, or, or God forbid, a terminal illness in terms of chronic or an end, late stage cancer from becoming opioid addicts. This is not, you know, nefarious members of the underworld. This is not opium dens from the 18th century. Mm -hmm. These are ordinary Rhode Islanders who, whether it be in, our, in debates, can argue about whether exactly. it happens to be their body chemistry or whatever, are reacting to a legally sold product. And, and, and one of the issues here is as this bill began, as it began through the legislative process, you had testimony at the committee Mm -hmm. um, you heard from what I would use the term all stakeholders in this time. Right. What disappointed me was the lack of interaction, communication, and a willingness to put all the parties at the table and come up with a piece of legislation mm -hmm. that all sides could live with, mm -hmm. and a fair piece of legislation. Right. Um, you know, you, when you look at a bill like this and addressing what you would be talking about, um, you talk about cancer patients, for example. You talk about uh, compassion counselors mm -hmm. who would deal with individuals who are suffering from the type of condition that they're yearning for some type of pain medication. Desperate, um, desperate for it. And the, so what you see here is you take a combination of that. You take the enactment of the Good Samaritan Act. Mm -hmm. You now look at how that plays into the passage of this law you're going to have some situations where there are going to be people that are laying out on the street, have taken one of the most severe form of, of, of narcotics that, that's out on the street. There's not going to be anybody that's going to want to help them. Right. And they're going to run. And, and you know, the, the old argument that somebody shows up or an officer and there's, a, there, there's the knock on, they're not going to want to give somebody knock on yeah. after they've had that type of ingestion of that powerful because at that point even if you save them they may be suffering from other body functions that right. become totally deteriorated mm -hmm. by by the ingestion of that very strong narcotic that they've been sold so this bill uh, is a disappointment in a way to how and usually the legislative process evolves right one we generally are cognizant, as you said, of what our mission is mm -hmm. in the court system, in the recovery community, mm -hmm. and how we bring people together to come up with a piece of legislation that everyone can live with. Mm -hmm. I have um, colleagues who walked and didn't want to vote because they felt torn between what the medical community was 
discussing, what mm -hmm. the recovery community was discussing, and then part of what the judicial and the law enforcement community. Right. So they 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 have they were juggling so many uh, emotions that they decided that they couldn't make uh, a, a fair vote on the bill, and they right. walked, which tells me that the bill was problematic from day one. Right, and and the frustration, of course, is despite, I mean, very often the the, uh, the folks up on Smith Hill are pilloried fairly sometimes, unfairly sometimes, for how they manage the process. And when you have stakeholders who are making, and, and again, like my prior guest, you know, you've got a combination of folks who are, are wise from years in the streets and working with people, and then you've got highly trained clinical scientists and public health advocates who are all coming together. And, 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 and I argued in the beginning of the show, in, in a twisted way, some of this type of legislation is a unifying factor in the state because you're bringing together different camps of people who've never worked, I mean, talk about odd bedfellows. Um, I, the unanimity of opposition, when I, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to have Steve DeToy from the American yes, Medical Association. Absolutely. Uh, when someone like him, who is a, an articulate... Very respected at the very, legislature. Right. A very reasonable gentleman who, who steps back and really takes a broad and long view towards issues like this. When you see the type of, I, I don't know if I could ever use the word violent and, and Steve DeToy in the same sentence, but that sort of the highly charged principal opposition that he's taken to this in, in going public directly to the governor and politely, because Steve DeToy is nothing but a consummate professional, all right, de demanding that this law be vetoed. Is, is, is if you're within the bubble, the legislative bubble, is astonishing in and of itself and testament to how virulently folks in this community oppose it. I, I, I can't agree with you more. Um, at this point, um, I think the medical community, I think the uh, recovery community, I think the legislators, the senators and the reps who were brave enough to mm -hmm. speak out against the bill, mm -hmm. uh, who were brave enough to vote no on the bill. Um, we need to continue conversation. Um, this is the type of issue that um, no matter how hard we work at it, we may never conquer it, but we have to keep fighting it with practical and reasonable approaches. Mm -hmm. This is not a practical and reasonable, reasonable approach to the problem. Um, what, what I think we need to do is also think about the fact that if we continue to legislate these type of laws for these type of problems in a state that is small enough to get a handle, mm -hmm. uh, our resources are limited. Uh, we are always fighting budgetary issues mm -hmm. and trying to figure out where we're going to fund, where we will obtain the monies. Our revenue streams sometimes dry up. We have to make hard choices. But this choice, the choice to deal with this issue, the opioid issue in the state of Rhode Island, given the size of the state, uh, the quality of health care, the medical institutions, the universities, mm -hmm. with the type of personnel, the Brown Medical Institution, the research that can be done in biotech and from the University of Rhode Island through the hospitals here, um, we're small enough that we can address this problem, create a quality, a quality program that can be implemented in a state as small as Rhode Island. Uh, it could be a model for others if they have the money and exactly. the funds to do it. Ex exactly. I mean, so, th this is... This is an opportunity for Rhode, for Rhode Island to lead. Shine, absolutely. To lead, to, to take, you know, this is a state that, that is known in so many ways. We're celebrating pride this weekend. Right? Absolutely. All right? Rhode Island has been blessed in many ways by always having one of the most progressive outlooks towards folks in the LGBTQ community. Um, that same type of compassion that has exhibited in this, in this state for, for hundreds of years, literally, needs to be directed to, to people who are marginalized, impaired by another issue. And, and why do we need to go back? You talk about resources. You know, didn't we as a nation, uh, and I'll say it from a, from a law enforcement perspective, didn't we learn from three strikes, you're out? Absolutely. 
I, I mean, three, you know, if folks have never followed that issue, most states at this point are recoiling from three strikes, you're out, because number one, you had this Les Mis-like approach to justice where someone literally stealing the proverbial slice of bread, if that was his third strike, they were subject to mandatory, non-interpretable uh, jail sentences that even at times the judiciary looked at and said, even the most hardened judge would look at and say, this is, this is ludicrous. And, and simultaneously creating a, a, a demand and draw on the resources of whatever that uh, state or a municipality was that were, were, were staggering. And at the same time, creating a permanent underclass of people who because of how we as a society look upon people who have been at fault, who have been fragile, who have been human, <laughs> just th this, this, this storm that occurred by three strikes is still affecting major metropolitan areas today. It, it not only still affects it, but this problem that we're dealing with doesn't discriminate. It reaches all communities, all mm -hmm. walks of life. Right. Race, religion, gender, mm -hmm. it, and so it's a common problem. Everybody has had some experience <laughs> with a family member, a friend exactly. who has had an addiction issue. And so we're all much wiser now. And what bothers me about this issue is that um, we cannot legislate something that is progressive rather than regressive. Right. This is a regressive law. We're this, stepping this, back. We're stepping back. By passing this bill, we're taking a step back rather than taking a step forward. Now, some, some individuals, and including the governor, had said that she was comfortable with the bill because she thought that there was judicial discretion in the bill. And my response to that is that while judicial discretion is something that we can hold out as hope, um, every person who goes through that court system mm -hmm. doesn't always get the type of representation right. or quality of That's counsel for sure. mm -hmm. that can influence a judge right. to utilize the judicial discretion favorable to that defendant mm -hmm. in the case. And I say that as a practicing attorney. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's that argument is not that's a flawful argument. That argument should not hold water or be a reason why one should believe that the the way the bill is crafted and that judicial discretion is a uh, safety net mm -hmm. uh, to the passage of that legislation. In fact, there probably would be a number of judges that would look at that legislation and be very uncomfortable imposing mm -hmm. the penal portion of that statute. Exactly. Uh, we already, for example, have a law on the books. If you look at a drug transaction and someone were to uh, die as a result, well, there, there is a statute on the first degree murder with drugs, and it's a 40-year sentence. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of these cases end up being in a plea bargain situation where someone would plead out and they would get a sentence. Mm -hmm. I think, in fact, the individual got 40 years that was involved in right. Kristen's law to begin with. Mm -hmm. So if you had a life situation, the, the scary part of it is that if someone got life, they're, uh, they're eligible under the Rhode Island parole system, under there for 20, the, after 20 years they come before the board. The fear, I think, of imposing a life sentence against an individual is that they won't get the parole after the 20 years, and they'll right. be there a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Somebody who may receive, i.e., in the case of Kristen's law, the situation involving the young lady, which was a very unfortunate and sad and tragic, um, that 40-year sentence, that person could very well be out before 20 years. Mm -hmm. May very well, with good time and, and programs within the prison and, and utilizing the Justice Reinvestment Commission, an individual who had a 40-year sentence might very well be out after 20 years. Right. So the question really becomes, what does this law really accomplish? And you know, I voted against it because I don't think it accomplishes a whole lot. Right. And it, as I said, it regresses us rather than progresses us. Right, and in, in the year 2018, we should be looking to move forward you know, utilize, you know, again, we're, as you pointed out, we were blessed in so many ways. Um, sometimes we're Islanders and our, me first amongst them being hardened cynics. We complain about this, we complain about that. We've got the finest universities on, in, in literally the planet. We've got some of the finest healthcare 
in the world, all surrounding us, and we've got thought leaders in place that should be able to look beyond this. And it's, and it's disappointing when something like this somehow manages to occur. And it's occurred a few times, and, and I think as a community, in moments like this, and, and maybe some good comes out of it, if we can A, get their veto this, and, un, and, and, and get a broader understanding, maybe in, in, in some way without re, 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 rebuilding the entire commission, maybe folks need to be reminded of the process that people went through so exhaustively just a few short years ago, and, and have a periodic revisiting of what our goals of a, of a penal system, what our goals, what we see as true justice, and, and and, and, and reestablish that in people's mind. Well, I, I think one of the things that um, that's incumbent upon a member who serves in the um, General Assembly, whether you're a senator or a representative, mm. is that you really have to go out into the community and know and understand mm -hmm. the people that you represent and what their plight is, what their problems are. Right. Get, go into the public housing projects in the city of Providence. Go into the three and six decker homes in the city of Providence. Right. Talk to these children and their families. Go into the recreation centers and mm -hmm. talk to those kids who are part of programs, after school programs, mm -hmm. and summer programs. Find out um, what people are thinking. And if you have to, then we need to bring these people to the state house mm -hmm. and let the full legislature see them and understand what their problems are. Mm -hmm. You know, recently um, in early June was the uh, anniversary of the uh, assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy. Right. And one of the views of Senator Kennedy was that we don't know what kind of world we might have had if Robert Kennedy wasn't assassinated mm -hmm. and became president. But one of the things that Robert Kennedy did when he ran for president before he was assassinated is he went deep into the rural part of America. He went into <coughs> different parts of West Virginia and deep in the South right. and in northern cities. And he sat with people and he asked people what what were the prevailing problems in the state and the country at that time. Mm -hmm. What were you feeling in your home, in your small apartment, in that car that just about made it to work and back? What, what were you thinking each and every day? What were your struggles? What were the problems your family was having? We need to do that. Rhode Island is a small state. We need to find out what people are thinking. If we really want to address this issue, we ought to be talking more to these. We know how many victims there are each year, how many overdose. Right. What kind of dialogue do we have with those families? and brothers and sisters and parents of those who have overdosed? Mm -hmm. Do we bring them into a circle and talk to them and find out what that common element is mm -hmm. and what's really happened in the lives of these people? Let's not forget them. Yeah. Let's in some way try to honor them and find out what caused them to mm -hmm. take that path that ended their life tragically and how can we prevent more individuals now mm -hmm from falling into that same road that they went down. Right. And we, as I said, we're a small enough state and we need to reach out and this is should be a challenge for the leadership and the legislators. We're the ones who pass the laws. We're the one who pass the budget. We are the body that decides how we're going to spend our money. It's incumbent upon us to have the kind of programs that will prevent these kind of tragedies from happening. We are, again, a small enough state to manage this problem. We won't be foolproof, but at the same time, I think we can make a real dent in this problem. And one really only look to the medical cannabis program right. as an example of leading from the front. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, you know, Mr. Slater and, and, and the entire community that brought that to fruition labored somewhat in obscurity for years to, to finally craft a solution that has positively impacted people's lives. Now, I'm someone obviously who's gonna argue for full legalization, Absolutely. but at the same time, let's honor that spirit rather than, 
it's such a Neanderthal approach, and, and I'm, I have to keep it clean. Well, I mean, well, 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 we keep we keep commissioning things, and, and mm -hmm. you know, we ultimately we we will have to get to the question of full legalization, right. and it's something that we need to address, and we need to vote on, and we need to ask elected officials, do you have the courage to vote yes on a bill that would legalize? marijuana in the state of Rhode Island. Right. And if people don't have the courage to put that vote out there, then we're never going to be able to address that issue and come to grips with all of the work that has been done on that issue. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's delay and deny. It's almost like justice in the court system. Delay and deny. Oh, it'll be another year. Hold it for further study. Right. We can't afford to hold things anymore for further study. We need to address issues. Uh, if you want to get elected to office, whether it's a representative, a councilman, a senator, you part of your responsibility is to make sound and courageous votes on issues that right. affect people every day. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, then you shouldn't run for office and hold office. That was very well said. And you're clearly someone, from what I'm reading, willing to take a stand. Oh, I've taken stand. I voted no on tolls. I voted no on the deep water. I, I've had. I voted no on the Pawtucket Red Sox. I voted no on a lot of issues. Is, so, is that Pawtucket Red Sox? Is that a thing? The Pawtucket Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> I voted no on the stadium <laughs> deal. No on the vote. No on. The, but uh, it, 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 it. What I'm saying is that. There, there are a lot of issues at the state house that um, ultimately we need to take up. You're not running a popularity contest up there. I don't think you can run a popularity contest, but what you can do is listen to the people that you represent. Mm -hmm. I pay attention to my emails. I pay attention to my community and neighborhood mm -hmm. meetings. We have very active community neighborhood meetings. I tell some of my colleagues that I may have two or three neighborhood meetings in a month. I will have a response from some of my colleagues. I haven't had a neighborhood meeting in two years. I mean, I have, we, we have a very active, my district is the West End, the Armory, Oneyville, Manton, Hartford, mm -hmm. Down City District, Mount Pleasant, Elmhurst, mm -hmm. um, very intelligent, group of voters. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a, a great balance of, of issues in the neighborhood. You have to listen to what your constituency... I, I had many emails that came to me on this issue. They were very aware of this bill. You, I, you probably have, I think it's fair to argue, the most diverse economically, racially, uh, ethnically, social district possibly in the state. I do. I, I, I sometimes I say I have the haves and I have the have nots. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to balance the importance of each group. Right. I just finished going to a um, an opening of a, uh, a bio company in the Valley Valley Street District, in right. the Oneyville District. Dr. Annie DeGroot, uh, the company called Epivax. Mm -hmm. um, biotech company starting up smack in the middle of Oneyville near the rising mills. Yeah. Right next to there is a clinic that was opened with Dr. DeGroote at the time, I think was Mayor Cicilline, Congressman Cicilline was the mayor. Uh, we put together some funding for a clinic that's called L'Esperance, which is a medical clinic that provides medical services to the needy in the district. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that everyone can't get to an emergency room. Right. Everyone shouldn't go to right. an emergency room. Exactly. That we ought to have more community clinics and more quality service should occur in those clinics, right. including someone who might have an opioid problem. Mm -hmm. And that may be their first stop rather than a hospital. Or a more. Or, more. or, a, or, or exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the kind of things that if you have a community, my community is very interested in the question of legalizing marijuana. Mm -hmm. I get multiple emails on a regular basis of when are these issues. Woman's reproductive rights is an important issue in mm -hmm. my district. People repeatedly send me emails on those issues. Right. Um, so sooner or later we have to address those issues. Um, and uh, this this opioid, the, the, the issue of this 
particular bill being passed um, is bothering many, many people in many levels of the state of Rhode Island. It and bothers the working person and it's bothering the executive. And because ultimately all of them have still, I, I can't imagine there's at this point there's very many people in Rhode Island who don't have some sort of extended personal connection to the opioid crisis. I would say everybody has a connection and it's a small enough state that you can talk to someone and somewhere in their life, if it hasn't been their experience, it's been a loved one or a friend. Or it may have happened and they just haven't heard about it. Exactly. Until, unfortunately, sometimes it's too late. And, or or they, someone will disclose to them many, many years later that this mm -hmm. was an experience I had. I didn't want to share it with you, but now I'm going to share it with you. And it, it opens their eyes right. to the fact that, wow, there is an individual that uh, is functioning now at a level that I could never envision that that mm -hmm. person could have ever experienced a problem involving right. substance abuse or some form of right. addiction. And, and it makes them understand that, look what we can do if we really find the right programs and we spend the money and we attack the problem with solutions, not crazy legislation. Right, because ultimately, how many human rights issues, whether it be ethnically based, racially based, in terms of sexual identity, healthcare, it may be a function of the criminal justice system, how many human rights issues have we ultimately conquered because folks finally stopped seeing that group being marginal? I always say, if, if you refer to a group with, and, and you start the description with the, then you are not sufficiently familiar with these people as human beings. And you know, at this point, it's the addicts or the recovery. And if you say that, that probably means you just haven't come to terms with it in your own life. And once we overcome that, and it's not the, it's not an identity group, group but is my buddy Bill, who I play softball with, or you know, my friend Susan, who I go to church with, or fill in the blanks, or my cousin, or this, you know, it, then I, I don't know what hope there is. Maybe that's what we have to do as part of this process now. Finally bring it home to every individual who's in a position of responsibility. Well, I think, I think that's why when um, we process a piece of legislation and we look at the underlying legislative intent mm -hmm. and then ultimately what the effect is going to be of the passage on that bill. For example, sometimes we pass legislation and a member of a committee will say, do you have a fiscal impact on that? Right. Do you have a fiscal note? Mm -hmm. Tell me what the fiscal note is, either the cost or what it's going to result in. Well, on bills that deal with the lives of people, sometimes you can't come up with a fiscal note, mm -hmm. but what you do come up with is what is the human effect mm -hmm. of the passage of that legislation. That is as serious as a fiscal note. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're dealing with someone's life and how we legislate that, I think it's just so important. With this particular bill, we did not have a long enough, a strong enough, and a healthy enough conversation mm -hmm. with all the stakeholders before this bill was passed. And I think that's why uh, the ultimate uh, passage of it, it we're, getting, we're getting a kickback on it now right. because the people who really should have been heard and included were not. Right. Do you have, in closing, and, and, and again, I'm so grateful because I know the demands in your time. Um, as so, you know, it, it's always fascinating to me, if you're an activist and uh, you go up there for certain issues, unless of course you're Randall Rose and you're there for every <laughs> issue. God goes there on every issue. God bless him. I, and I mean Boy, that. He, he has yeah, a great stamina, Randall yeah, Rose. His work ethic is Absolutely. astonishing. And he knows each bill and what the purpose is and is very informed. And he, when he always testifies, prepares. he's very prepared. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Boston Red Sox should be as prepared <laughs> as, as Randall Rose is. But what's interesting to me as someone who follows certain issues very closely, you guys are up there regardless. Everything. Every night. All every night. Every night. All night. At least three nights a week, and it will be probably four nights a week next week, and hopefully within a couple of weeks we'll be finished. Right. right. Do you have a, a, a message, if you will, 
Um, we're going to take this tape and we're going to blast it all over social media this weekend in an effort to politely and, and with, with a positive attitude uh, generate a sense of, of how the community feels so that we can reach out to the governor who, who can possibly put this madness to an end. Let's send it back. Let's take a deep breath and, and figure out what we're really trying to accomplish. Do you have a message for the governor's office that you'd like to, that you'd like uh, to convey at this moment? No, I, I have great respect for the governor, and I mm -hmm. think that if the governor really looks at this issue and she does her research and her homework and mm -hmm. she has the correct people advise her mm -hmm. as to what the negative implications are of the passage of this law, and she takes a real hard look for the sake of all individuals that deal with addiction and recovery and for the families and the people that we have lost and we can lose in the future. Governor, do not sign this bill into law. Veto the bill. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. It's great to sit on the same side of the table. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I don't be surprised. We may sit on the same side more than you think. <laughs> Senator Paul Jabor joining the coalition on a busy Friday night. Will you be out and about during Pride tomorrow? Will you be in the community? I will be there. I took out an ad as well. And I saw that. I'll be with some of my uh, colleagues from the neighborhood. I'll be there tomorrow. Great. You'll see the Libertarian Party marching. Thank Come you. march along with us for a few minutes, okay? I'll be there. Thank you. All right. Come on in. We're going to have to go to one more Hi, neighborhood. Yeah. Good to see you again. The various member of the underworld here with you. <laughs> That's me. I'm the notorious. I'm like the Irish, ver uh, Irish version of the notorious B.I.G. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm, I'm as gangster as a middle-aged guy gets. Okay. Are we live? <laughs> hey, we're live. Okay. Folks, let me just uh, draw back for a few seconds here. Um, first of all, uh, our long-suffering... Highly professional <laughs> producer Joe. Hey Joe, I think we're supposed to change the the, uh, the ad. <laughs> Folks, I want to take a second first of all to thank our sponsors. Um, you know, we've we've got a variety of sponsors who are willing to support um, challenge programming like this. And when I say challenge, the issue is serious. The issue is important. We try to bring the issue home to you. But not every company is going to sponsor a three-hour com conversation about addiction and recovery and a highly controversial law. Just, that's not going to happen. So, I just want to take this time to reach out, first of all, to airsciences.net, owned by Daryl Gould, operating in the East Bay. Biohazards, mold remediation, bringing a sense of, I shall say, a sense of peace and a sense of, and a very real safety to your home, to your office, to your, to your school, and eliminating the biohazards that challenge all of us on a daily basis. Airsciences.net. Please reach out to Daryl. Folks, if you also find yourself suffering you. uh, with an illness that may have compromised your immunity, uh, please reach out to Daryl at Airsciences.net. They've got very, very special programs um, that are tailored specifically for po folks who are suffering. Um, I don't think anyone needs to know how we feel about Yacht Club Bottling Works, the finest soda on the planet. I love Yacht Club soda. In fact, I'm going to have to take a break shortly to get a good to, to take a swig, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the folks at Yacht, the Scambato family, Yacht Club Bottling Works have been with us for 103 years, the official soda of the state of Rhode Island. They are Rhode Island's boutique soda before we needed, we needed a boutique soda. Um, yeah, natural flavors, real sugar as opposed to the refinery stuff. Don't drink the stuff that's out of a chemical plant. You got the real deal here, real ginger, real vanilla, natural flavoring. It's delicious. You know, we're in fully into now the barbecue season. You're going to you're going to have your family over. You know, we're coming up to the July 4th weekend. You know, you're going to spend all sorts of money. It doesn't matter whether you're vegan, if you're seafood, or steaks, burgers, whatever. You're, you're going to roll out the very best. Don't settle for the refinery soda. You know, support a local business. We've uh, given a great deal of time over the last few weeks about how they've been challenged by some pending legislation. Um, they make a great product and that's why you should buy it at the same time let's root for the hometown team here you can find them at Eastside marketplace you can find them at their bottling facility in centerdale you can also find them at fine restaurants around the city and on saturday mornings you can find them at really one of rhode island's great farmer markets that takes place every saturday during the summer it's at the base of hope and blackstone boulevard 
and you'll see a variety of farm to table products as well as the finest yacht in Southern Maine. Beacon Shipping and Logistics, finally, they've been with us since the very beginning. 18553 Ship It. Imagine if you had professional, world class automobile shipping within with international reach, and they're based right here in scenic Cork, Rhode Island. Yep, 18553 Ship It. They service a significant part of the dealer and professional automobile industry world. They can do the same for you. Their same reach is international, and whether you be buying that car off of eBay, uh, maybe you found that great internet find in Iowa and you just want to capitalize on your savings by having it shipped out to here as opposed to having to schlep out there and drive it back. 18553 ship it. All of these companies deserve your support because they support us and as a result they support the community. Folks, we are at the midway part of a very special show. Last night legislation was passed by your House of Representatives. Ill-fated, ill-considered legislation that essentially criminalizes recovery in so many different ways. It criminalizes folks' involvement in recovery, criminalizes folks' involvement in addiction. There are so many tentacles that this reaches into the community and essentially takes discretion away from courts, away from civil authorities, and places people firmly in the prison pipeline, and it needs to, be, needs to die. We're asking folks who hear this over the weekend or tonight to take a moment to reach out to Gina Raimondo politely and say, regardless of your early support for this legislation, what ended up being generated was, again, ill thought and quite frankly dangerous. People will die as a result of this. Regardless of the fact it's an election year, regardless of the politics involved, regardless of who supported it, whatever their intentions were, let's take the high road, reach out to her, point out the the severe challenges this represents to the community, and let's put this bill to death. So, you are listening to The Coalition on the Worldwide Coalition Radio Network. Coalitionradio.us, Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio, and our all apolitical billionaire baseball boys club Twitter feed at Pawtucket is home. Looks like that's going to gin up again one more time. One more time with feeling, as Arlo would say, it's going to come up from the basement, from the bathtub, and reach out and try and grab us. So please pay attention to that this week as we one more time, with feeling, try to defeat corporate welfare for a group of entitled individuals who, by the way, have yet to deign us with their presence any one of the hundreds of hearings that have been heard about this, and instead would rather try to buy your affection through their support of some well-meaning, but ultimately a misinformed charities in around the Pawtucket area. So tonight we're, we're spending the entire three hours covering this. We'll be sharing it this, this weekend. Um, joining us is no stranger to the coalition. Tell, yes, tell, tell us all about you. You're, you're, all right, great. And, 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 and we had a conversation a few weeks ago that was pretty emotional. Yeah, this and, is an emotional issue. And uh, because it's personal. And it actually should be personal for all Rhode Islanders. But I just, if you, and, and we're very careful with this because we're not looking to um, dramify, we're not looking to, um, again, take advantage of a situation and, and, and create drama or titillate or entertain you. This is, this is as brutal as it gets. This is the real world here at the Coalition. But I'm going to leave you alone to camera for a minute. Here. I just want you to tell your story. and. What this legislation, you're, you're in full recovery. Yes, full you, recovery. It'll be five years on the 25th of this month. Yeah. Right. You're, uh, you're in school, yes. you're working, yep. great personal, I mean, you've got a lot of great things going on. Yeah. You know, the, but if you could tell just a little bit about your story, as it would have been affected by the passage of this bill when you weren't in recovery. And I think, okay. I, I'm just going to leave you alone for a second right. and just, just kind of, just kind of lay it out there for people because I think, unfortunately, I think we live in a society where uh, if people are affected by this and it's not personally but it's a family member, they may not know, they may not be cognizant, they may be frankly in denial. Mm -hmm. And until we make this personal for people so that they really understand what's involved, the strength ne necessary to go five years in recovery, mm -hmm. I would argue that many of the people that I know in recovery are mentally stronger and tougher than just about any of the folks I know 
from the uh, from the normie world. Things are easier to deal with nowadays. Once you've dealt with that, everything else is just kind of like a cakewalk. It's it's a lot easier once you've gotten that, got a hold on that. What, once you've tamed the beast a little yes. bit. Yes. All right. So I'm, I'm going to leave you alone for just okay. a second. I'll be back in a couple minutes. You want me to speak? Yeah. I, I want you to just tell your story. Okay. Um, my name is Ailey McKee. I am a person in long-term recovery. I think how my story would apply and why I've been asked to speak is because my story does draw some parallels to the issue at hand with the drug abuse homicide bill. Um, I'm a person that was incarcerated for a death resulting charge. I had an accident about seven and a half years ago that tragically left someone uh, young that lost their life. Uh, I had a heroin addiction thereafter that really took a toll on my family and everybody around me and myself. Um, and as I said, I was incarcerated for a short period of time. Um, I had the benefit of meeting a recovery coach by the name of Michelle Harder. I keep on saying her name every time I tell my story because that for me was the pivotal piece that really set off a connection of you know what was going on with me and what I needed to do to make sure that when I came back home that I wasn't in the same place that I left. And I got home and I've been a pretty high function, happy person for the last three years since I've gotten released from prison. Uh, I had a home confinement bracelet and up until December 30th. Um, and I'm a full-time student at Rhode Island College. I get 100 averages in every one of my classes. I'm going to Brown University next year. I'm getting two bachelor's degrees in psychology, chemical dependency, and addiction studies. I feel most comfortable around my own kind and my own kind of people in recovery that have kind of seen fire and, and know what it's like to deal with something like that. Um, I'm starting to get into public service and you know, volunteering, and I really like it. It makes me feel good. Um, My story's so long. I just, you know, I almost want to touch on what's been going on uh, to kind of condense it because I can relate with a lot of the issues that have been on the forefront lately. And uh, this morning I woke up and I opened up my Facebook and went on News Channel 12 to see what the vicarious reactive attitudes were in response to the passing of the drug induced homicide bill. And while I know that these responses aren't really an accurate representative sample, of what the general public might feel. Um, I was disappointed, and I was disappointed because the responses were more sided in blaming the victim, who was Kristen Kutu. Um, and that makes me sad, because as much as I'm opposed to this bill, I think that as a whole, this, this problem has come down to, recently, the nature of blame in response to this epidemic. And I think that's what we're seeing in our legislature right now, is to put the blame on an individual. Um, I read in a, the Attorney General's letter that placed the blame on the medical community for causing this epidemic. I know what I read this morning, blame the victim, the person that had passed, and uh, none of these things capture the complexity of addiction and the underlying issues that can lead a person to start going down the path where they start medicating, self-medicating for problems, whether they're traumas or they're environmentally predisposed, whether it's our media that glorifies it, whether it's just by happenstance. Um, and I'll be the first one to say firsthand, I do not believe in decriminalization. I kind of sit in the middle. I'm more of a conservative type of person in recovery. Um, so I don't I don't embrace decriminalization of substances. I think that there is a place for people when they're profiting from the sale of something that's making somebody sick or worst case scenario leads to their death. But I don't think branding them as a murderer is appropriate. I don't think them incurring the full fault of blame for a person's demise captures the picture of what happened to them. I don't think it honors their life after their death. And I think it's a really irresponsible way to put a stamp on this one and say, all right, we solved the problem. We got the bad guy. We're going to lock them up for 20 years, 25 years. Um, and I want to wait until Pat gets back to share just kind of what some of my observations were these past 
few weeks, month or so, um, as kind of a civilian that was a fish out of water. I spent a lot of time at the State House, and uh, I spent a lot of time talking to our senators and representatives. And I got uh, just a strong sense that they're just completely out of touch with this epidemic, um, that if this were in their hands, that it w could have dire effects. Um, and that's something I want to talk about. And uh, I think it's important to stop playing the blame game. You know, stop pinpointing. It's the addict's fault. They, they did it to themselves. They killed themselves. It's the medical community's fault. It's big pharmacies, and there might be something to the big pharmacies' fault, but um, or the or the distributor. Uh, I think all these things can first uh, can have a part and play a part in a tragedy like an overdose death. But I think to be solutions based, we need to stop blaming because this is a medical health public health crisis and blaming doesn't help this, blaming doesn't fix this, it just creates more of the same. Um, and I think this is a really important issue a lot of people that I spoke to personally with. I don't think there's a lot of people left in the state of Rhode Island, unfortunately, that can't personally relate to this issue in some way or another. Uh, a lot of the people that I spoke with either work on the front lines or they've lost a loved one, family member, a friend. Um, and I think that's kind of what's been driving this legislation. That's the drug-induced homicide bill. It's very emotionally reactive to a very emotional issue, but it is also a public health crisis. Um, this is a medical issue. We don't blame people for illnesses or ailments. We don't blame people, even cigarette smokers, we don't blame them and say, well, it's their fault that they get, they get lung cancer, or we need to stop blaming people um, if we're gonna if we're gonna try to reverse some of these numbers, which they've had a lot of success with. I I firmly believe that the people that are best adept at acknowledging or handling or steering this issue are the people on the governor's task force. We're extremely lucky to have universities like Brown University and some of the best-minded epidemiologists on the forefront of this, along with the recovery community that is extremely forward-thinking, extremely progressive, um, just from the Anchor Moore team. And all of these things that have kind of cumulatively come together to start to re revert these numbers, despite the presence of, the increasing presence of fentanyl in our substances and just the lethality of the things that are on the street nowadays. They're working on it, and it's uh, it's not perfect, but um, I read the, the Attorney General's letter. Um, I think that he referred to people that weren't supporting his bill as his opponents, and that was kind of telling as far as how he's looking at this. It almost speaks to the fact that he's registering himself as a, as a separate entity in this solutions-based matter that the people that are working on this and the front lines people and the recovery community are his opponents. And that's scary for me. I, there were a lot of things that I read in that letter um, that he had sent over to our legislators just from referencing the drug policies that had been in effect since the 80s, which is basically our Reagan era drug policy. We know how that went. Um, is part of a reasoning for these things to stay in place. Um, the scare tactics that he kind of shamed people who are in opposition to this legislation, I think are misplaced. He has, the people that designed this drug-induced homicide bill have specifically come out and said that this is a deterrent, um, which a deterrent is in this sense essentially a scare tactic. There's no other way of looking at that. Um, mimics the failed war on drugs, and um, there was just a lot to that that I thought was glaringly like terrible. Um, particularly the part where the attorney general um, blamed the medical community for creating this epidemic, because I don't think that that's fair a fair assessment either. Um, I'm waiting for Pat to come back. Is Pat coming back? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay, sorry. If you're if you're having no. a snack. No, it's a uh, very powerful. I appreciate your. No, I'm sorry. To, I know you're probably taking a break. I wanted to talk about some of the things that no, no. Uh, I, I saw in the last month with our legislators, and, because I, I think I have a little bit more 
would be a way to do that because I'm not coming, you know, I don't have a boss that's, you know, I'm, I don't have a, you know, I'm not looking down, have a speaker looking down at me and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just, uh, I'm nobody, so. Yeah, but you're, 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 <laughs> you're <laughs> I always have a, a, a great deal of admiration, more admiration and more respect for people who are able to overcome adversity than those few select people who manage to perhaps achieve great things but never really be challenged. Um, life throws curveballs, you know, there's a thousand cliches, but the reality is that the folks who can somehow summon up the courage to overcome those adversities, quite frankly, need not to exist in any sense of shame, but need to be pointed out as objects of admiration. And um, because that's, that's the real world. You know, it's, it's very easy I'm sure it would have been far easier at, at, at some point in time during this horrific process for you to have just simply given up. And, and I'm, I will never profess to stand in your shoes or to say that at any one time that became something in your mind as an option. I won't that project that on anyone because I simply don't know. But I had an opportunity a couple of years ago to stand in front of, it was about 20 degrees out, and I stood in front of a crowd of people who were going to uh, uh, to, to testify against uh, increasing or placing a tax on medical cannabis. And I'm standing there in front of, in, in bitter cold weather, in front of some people who are no longer with us. They're, they literally succumbed to late stage cancer. Uh, these are people who were suffering from severe neuromuscular diseases. Um, and, you know, there are a couple of us who were asked to speak. And, you're really cheering us on. I said, wait a minute, you, you got to take a moment out here. I, and, and I just asked everybody to look at each other. Don't worry, hey, I'm, 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 just a, I'm just a cheerleader there. And applaud each other. And that, I think, has to happen within your community as well. Because, you know, again, these are people who are warriors, uh, like yourself, who face adversity every day on a daily basis and somehow manage to overcome it. And some days better than others, I'm sure. But that's, again, that's where real strength comes from. For those folks in communities where they find themselves in a privileged position to rule, if you will, uh, and are willing to project that power onto other people's lives based on uh, misinformation, cliches, sheer personal self-interest, sheer desire, and there's always a certain personality that just likes to be in charge. Mm -hmm. We've met them all. Um, I have nothing to say to them uh, because those are the folks at moments like these are, are, are desperately challenging other people's lives and I don't know that we'll, I'm not so naive as to think that we'll ever do away with that in government. There will always be that element, but we're also blessed at a time when through, whether it be the Facebook, whether it be you know people's appetite to take on a challenge that we as a community can defeat that. So I, I stand in rapt admiration of anyone who overcomes any of those type of challenges because quite frankly, I don't know if I could. So I just, uh, you know, as far as folks like you or your community not being on a par with them, you're right, you're not. You are light years beyond them, light years. You know, the biggest challenge they may ever face is, you know, dreading that, that long day in an office building or or not quite having the 56-inch the color TV. Uh, uh, folks like you have, have stared into the face of adversity and won. So um, I think that's the first thing that needs to happen in the recovery community. Uh, assume that you guys actually are smarter, faster, stronger uh, than, than folks who just happen to find themselves in a position where they can dictate to the rest of us. And from that, this draw from the same strength that you used to overcome adversity that brought you here in the first place, and then use that same strength to assert yourself and to, con to, to take back control from people like our Attorney General and just take it away from them and take complete charge. Uh, and then, because quite frankly, I think the best leaders are people who have suffered through adversity, who have suffered. And then, because at least, regardless of the challenge, it may be a different challenge, at least there's empathy there. And I would argue um, the prior legislator visit us clearly has a great deal of empathy. 
um, not sympathy, but empathy. Um, you don't need sympathy. Um, people need to understand what you face and, 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 and try to draw strength from that. Um, there is a severe shortage of empathy in government these days as they dictate. They can't really, I mean, a person that's never been exposed to something, no. the best they can only have sympathy. That's the most you can hope for. And, you know, I wouldn't wish any sort of, you know, mental health issues on anybody. And, you know, it's that's the sense that I got from my time with our legislators, most of them, um, is that there's just a detachment there, that they're not the most adept at dealing that, with that, 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 issue. that Folks like us, are sort of in the, the goldfish in the, in the glass. And I, I get to always the sense there's an element of like, they're standing outside the goldfish and yeah. they're doing this, like as if we're some object of curiosity or God forbid entertainment. And that's fine, and that's why I put myself out there um, and I'm candid about that because I think that it's important for people to be honest. Um, I think if people were honest when they were in the throes of addiction, and I don't think that's by any fault of their own that they're not. I think that, you know, the current climate now is part of the reason that fuels people to isolate and, you know, that builds our stigmas and, mm -hmm. and marginalizes people. I think that if people were more, if it was easier for people to come out and say that they were suffering and struggling, we wouldn't be dealing with just the, this massive loss of life that we're dealing with right now. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I was a quiet addict. You know, I used heroin. I don't think anyone actually even knew I used heroin other than the people I used heroin with. You were highly functioning? Oh, I, I think that's an overstatement, but I don't, you know, I, I'm still in a relationship that I've been in for 11 years. He had no idea. He had no idea. You know, he was asking me about a few weeks ago. You had no marks on your arms. You had nothing. I just, I was able to kind of keep it quiet. And, you know, we... We kind of medicate quietly. Our deaths are quieter. People don't, you know, funeral services for people that pass away from overdose death, a lot of times they're hushed. And uh, it's only when we recover that sometimes we're, we want to go out and talk about it. Mm -hmm. But that I think that needs to change so people can ask for help. I think that, you know, I know that I have some opposition from people that just can't understand me. And I understand that because I know it makes them uncomfortable. I can't imagine if I was still in active addiction and trying to talk to people about my my active use, what the reception on that would be. I can't, I, and I, you know, I I don't know, I saw, I saw it this week. Um, I was actually called a junkie in the house yesterday. I had a, a representative by the name of, I think it was Justin Price. Um, I walked up to him, I'm doing a lot of lobbying in the Senate and the House. I found them to be completely two different animals. Like, it just, I'd never, I hadn't been in the State House since I was a second grader and went on a field trip. Like, I was You went on the official out. second grade? The second grade field trip. And right. just, you know, was, you still get the same feeling walking in. It's just a beautiful building and it's got a lot of history. Um, but, you know, I spent the first couple of weeks in the Senate while this drug abuse homicide bill was making its way through there. And, um, I found the senators to be generally a little bit more informed as to the issue, even if they were in support of this legislation, I found them to have a little bit more knowledge on how they were voting. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, when we made our way over to the House side, um, it was just entirely different. The first day that we got there, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was approached by a few reps that were just, they were honest, and they said, you know, this is the Speaker's bill. He's sponsoring it. Nothing's going to happen with it. It's going to get passed. And I thought they were joking. I honestly, because like as I said, I had no exposure to politics, and uh, I thought that was actually a joke. But it's just watching this kind of play out, and just um, I've had a lot of conversations with um, representatives. Um, as I said, the Justin Price one yesterday that was that was priceless. Uh, I was told to go and try to talk to him for reasons that kind of were evident once I did go and talk to him, and. Uh, Somebody else who's here saw saw this conversation. And, you know, this person was different. He was in an altered state of mind or something. He was a lot of weird body language and just kind of like I could smell things on his breath. And you know, he said, "Well, they're junkies." And I don't even know who he was referring to. I don't know if he was referring to the people that are getting potentially charged with this crime or the people that are dying from this epidemic, but he said, they're junkies, and he just kind of threw his hand up in the air, and he said, what? Is that term misplaced? And that's, like, that kind of, like, honestly captured what, what's going on here, because this person doesn't even know that 
that's a completely like kind of obsolete, like dated term that's that's right. harmful. So out of touch. You Again, know? That's, that's straight out of a bad 70s movie. Yeah. Like, and uh, I tried to talk to him, but I, I sensed he was in a different place at that time. And I don't know. I don't, I don't know what goes on there. But, um, you know, I, I talked to a lot of reps that said that um, a lot of them actually that said that they were skeptical about this bill or that they outwardly opposed it, that it was bad. It was a bad bill. Um, but just due to just coercive pressures and, you know, that they're their jobs, their, it was like political suicide. They our, and I'm a nobody. I'm coming in there, I don't know anything about anything about anything about law, I'm starting to learn. Um, and uh, they're candidly, you know, talking about this, about, you know, they're, you can sense the, like the, the dissonance within these people about, they know they're not doing the right thing, but they're kind of forced to do it anyway. And this was within the house. This was my perception from mm -hmm. having really candid conversations with a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the representatives. A lot of them got brave. And to be fair, there were a couple of people that stood in support of this bill last night that I felt had reasons at least based in some form of, right. you know, you know, if you're going to be charitable about this, like, some people on both sides that support this bill had at least intelligent reasons and their own reasons that may have been indicative of their constituents that they're, they're representing. And I respect that, but mm -hmm. most of it was not the case. Oh. Um, do you have a message for the governor? Because we're we're sending the governor actually a little bit of love tonight. Yeah, we're, we're trying to take the high road here. I think um, I think you know I, I love the governor's task force. I think they do amazing things. I really I like Jana Raimondo. I like Governor Raimondo quite a bit. I think she's you know she's a woman in politics, and that's you know she's she's our governor. That's amazing. I respect any woman that's just a go-getter and just, you know, I, I love what she's done for this epidemic and that's why I don't understand why we're not being a little bit more vociferous or just like why people are so quick to stick their head in the sand on, on, this, on this legislation, on this bill in particular. Like, like we're trying to open up the conversation and keep on doing positive things to help people that are suffering and struggling around us. A bill that's going to start blaming people for people's deaths, whether you know you're blaming the user, the dealer, the medical. It's it's we've got to get away from that. It's uh and I really like to see this bill at the very least, you know, not push so hastily as it stands now because there's so much opposition here, and the and the forces that are pushing it forward and moving it are not representative of the people that understand this public health crisis the most. And um, I don't even think it's representative of what the community wants, because I think the community is starting to gain some familiarity and some, mm -hmm. intimate, con some intimate contact with just the, the loss and the suffering and it's just the severity of this. It just, please just, before we move this along, I just ask Governor Raimondo to just maybe hold off until the next session, veto it in the meantime, please. Let's fine tune this and make sure that we're not going into this in any sort of emotional, reactionary way. And that this this legislation, any legislation that we put forward forward to deal with this epidemic is in line with all of the progress that we've made to kind of combat this and um, to deal with this as a public health crisis and, you know, solutions-based and not more of the same. Um, you know. I heard a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the House House members last night saying, well, there's 36 states on the books. There's 36 states on the books. Let's not be 37. It's no excuse. We've been the gold standard for treatment for this epidemic. Let's have our, any sort of laws or anything passed that works, it should work in conjunction. It should echo the progressive stance of our state, which has made some, you know, amazing right. gains. Let's be smarter. Be smarter. Let's a little bit of love and a little empathy goes a long way in solving a lot of problems. It does. Yeah. So, wow. Um, again, I, I what I what I'm, what I want to do for the for, for the next segment is, and the reason why I'm kind of bringing people in and out because I I want there to be interaction. We've got we've got such a range of smart people here tonight. Good. You know, Stephen Brown dialed in. Was kind enough to dial in. Um, you got the senator, 
uh, and we've got the guests who are here already, and it's a pretty unique lineup. There's a, there's a lot of experience, a lot of, a lot of smarts here. So the, I'm asking people to mix it up because it's, as, as someone who's allegedly the host, I stand topside and I can ask clinical questions, but I, I just I just don't have the experience, or you know, I haven't been there, and everybody in this building, except me and Joe, um, has got a, a much stronger, much keener perspective and insight into it. So that's why I'm kind of I'm kind of mixing people up because I I, I, I we started the show by analyzing how bad the law is. We started the show uh, critiquing um, the, uh, the reasons why it's here. We took a hard look at the, the war on drugs. We took a hard look at the legislative climate. And now what I'm going to ask, uh, maybe I'll have uh, Michael come in for a little bit and then Anne-Jane come in. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of mix it up a little bit because I'm, I'm asking you to, to speak to the audience that's listening tonight and who's going to listen this week because this is going to be everywhere, folks. I'm going to push this as hard as I've ever pushed anything because we are in emergency mode right now. There, there is the, the, the only way forward is for some miracle stop when the two, when Senate and House engage in reconciliation. I'm not expecting it. So right now it is up to the governor. This, this is essentially, you know, I'll make a cheesy analogy. It's, you know, it's one of those bad 1940s prison films and you're waiting for the governor to call and give a stay of execution. Mm. Because this literally is a stay of execution yeah. that we need from her because people will die. Yeah. And so it is uniquely within a governor's hands. Uh, I very uh, oppose her politically on just about every level, but it's not my role to speak tonight. It's, it's yours. And it's it's, it's, and it's Michael's role to speak tonight because you guys transcend normal politics, and so, hey Mike? Yep. Come on down. Because what I want, I want the two of you to talk about is just, uh, and, and then we're gonna mix people up again in another 10 minutes or so, is kind of come across this with, all right, let's take the high road. Let's assume that, you know, the miracle bottom of the ninth play takes place, and the governor uh, says, you know what, nah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bail on this. My reading is is that there's not enough votes in the House or Senate to overcome a veto. I think at that point a lot of people will just let it die. So let's take that let's take that approach and say, okay, what do we need to do, you know, to move forward? How how do we address this issue? And the two the three of you actually have a unique perspective on that that I quite frankly add no value to. So I'm gonna hand it over to the two of you. <laughs> oh, thank you again, Pat. Oh, so, it's actually a really easy short answer and a whole bunch of longer answers. So, I guess a real easy short answer is what's deliverable now. And so what was made available now is a tool for us to start to deal with the problems we're experiencing. In addition to, obviously, the need for a veto and making bad legislation go away, which I think is needed. Um, it is a piece of legislation that I had asked uh, Representative Aaron Regenberg, who's currently campaigning for Lieutenant Governor, to kindly introduce a bill that would expand our Good Samaritan law protections. And in doing so, we would be able to openly distribute narcotics testing supplies. And this is important, you know, for, again, the broad reasons of why consumer product safety works. You know, we're able to empower consumers directly. We're able to give them tools and education to learn about what's in the substances they're consuming and different ways in which they can keep themselves safe as a result of, you know, different testing mechanisms, particularly fentanyl at this stage. But we wanted it to be forward thinking. And so the, the bill was worded very broadly to incorporate all narcotics testing supplies. And it was actually just released by the Mode Summit um, by our Department of Health that they are, you know, recommending that we pilot programs, programs for narcotics testing and that we are able to do some true prevention work. Kind of on the back end, what I've been working on as, as that effort has been moving through our legislator, 
Um, so that is uh, House Bill 8132. The Senate version of the bill already passed uh, with a unanimous standing to motion uh, for a, a motion for passage. The entirety of the entire Senate stood to second the motion for passage, which was a unique occurrence, um, which very, very often does not happen. Um, and, and so what we've done is we've secured a, a relationship with the manufacturer. And in that process, we're able to get unique product codes printed onto each of the test you know, packaging as they're being distributed. And we're able to utilize really simple, easy to access either web-based or mobile app-based software to collect data on people's test results coordinate that by region in the state as we're collecting it because we're able to figure out which you know test strip packages are going out to which distribution points right and we're going to be able to actually report that data back in real time through prevent overdose rhode island working in conjunction with jesse ardnack max krieger brandon marshall one of our, our excellent uh, epidemiologists who has a very strong background in this particular epidemic um I'll wrap up this and I'll talk a little bit about his work too as well because I think that's equally important. Um, but just to say that we'll be able to actually issue consumer product safety alerts, which is you know one of the, the mechanisms that we have. Uh, you know I, I go through processes where I evaluate the, the safety of recovery homes. And one of the things that's come up is there was a massive recall of the, the fire extinguishers. There were plastic handle models that were recognized to be faulty. And so I have a website, I have a resource, I have a way that you know, those products are checked for quality and that information is communicated directly. The, the problem with having illicit substances is we have absolutely no mechanism of control of the market whatsoever. And the criminal justice system that we've propped up in place has, nothing, has done nothing but to remove some of the, the longest standing and potentially the best actors who have delivered a consistent service in, in providing controlled substances or at least access to controlled substances. And so as those folks have been removed, because there's still an existing demand that continues to grow, new actors emerge to take their place who have little or no experience, very little contextual education, and may not have the kinds of resources that the first actors had, those relationships that they've cultivated over sometimes periods of many decades where they had access to reliable controlled substances. Right, and so we're finding that the controlled substance supply has become increasingly unreliable and not a particular surprise, right? Because if this were any other industry where we aren't providing any method of regulation, where we aren't providing any oversight, and we have no ability to hold the people who are actually operating in the market accountable, that it would continue to grow more and more and more unsafe and people would die as a result. So unfortunately, here we are. You know, there are lots of people dying, we have a government that's wrestling with this idea of how do we deal with this. You know, the traditional pathway towards dealing with this has been, you know, to continue to put more people in prison. And what we found is that we've now had an increasing population of people addicted to substances. We have an increase in the number of actors that are, that are available in the market because of the increase in demand. And there has been absolutely no positive impact whatsoever um, because of the failed war on drugs. So what it has done is it has increased poverty and it has increased some of the other biopsychosocial indicators that do contribute to addiction, right? So childhood trauma, we know very much uh, contributes to, to addiction. You know, we have a, a child protective service system which is in severe need of an overhaul. You know, we have, it's roughly about five out of six investigations are turned back unfounded only after, you know, families are subjected to these incredibly invasive um, processes of investigation. Um, there is some tra traumatization that occurs many times because of this. Uh, it's not intended. It's certainly not, you know, the, the overt intention of, of the process. We're trying to keep people safe. But at the same time, there's a lot of harm that occurs as a result. We're looking at about 3.2 million people throughout the country. 2.5 of those are actually genuinely turned back as unfounded. There's no statistic out there available at any level that talks about the number of removals and placements that were turned back unsubstantiated. So we don't have a concrete figure attached to that. But what we do know is that of the 767,000 substantiated cases, that four out of every five of those cases is found back substantiated solely the 
impact of neglect or uh, maltreatment, which is a direct result of poverty. Um, so we do know that the vast majority of harm that is contributing to the, the, uh, the addiction crisis, I would say this more broadly, not just with opioids, but we've had wave after wave after wave of addiction, right, is because it's driven by poverty. And so as we continue to commit more resources towards criminalization, you know, we already spend more in the state of Rhode Island on criminalization than we do on secondary education. We're more committed to the investment of removing people's rights than we are in giving them opportunities. And, and so that is a drastic departure from our need to set our priorities straight. So we have not been able to do that. Uh, unfortunately, fear is one of the single most driving factors in political campaigns and you know, political cronyism and you know, the power that's consolidated within the legislator. It only serves to continue to perpetuate an agenda that is not genuinely driven by objective evidence and scientific scientific fact. And that's that's proof in this most recent legislative effort. We had literally almost the entirety of the, the public health and recovery community, the people who are by and large undisputedly the highest experts on dealing with this particular crisis. And we have found ourselves at an intersection when the, when the collective voice of that entire community does not hold more weight than one person who holds an office in the House of Representatives. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the crux of the problem. We need to have a commitment to uphold the value and the opinion that's backed by evidence, so this is not subjective opinion, of the medical community when they weigh in on a public health crisis. We have no legislative requirement to do that. I would propose, were I a legislator or maybe some other wise legislator who's out there listening, that we insert a requirement that matters that weigh in on public health must first go through a vetting process with a body that serves public health and get a formal recommendation and weigh in on the matter before a proposal is even brought into our legislator. By the time we're debating issues in front of the legislator, we have gone far too long along in the process. And so now we're entering into you know, public debate and it's diminishing the standing of our professions. And, and I really wanna emphasize that I don't sit in this chair to diminish the value of the work that our law enforcement community does do in our community. We understand that law enforcement can only be as effective as the tools that they're given. And I think it's extremely important that we give our law enforcement professionals the best tools that we can to be able to do their job effectively. You know, I had a very meaningful conversation with a very nice experienced officer uh, at the State House shortly after this vote. And it felt very peculiar to me. For me, being a harm reductionist, you know, somebody who has worked progressively to try to uh, stymie some of the death from overdose by working with people directly in the street, performing needle exchange services, nearly being incarcerated for distributing naloxone. I mean, this has been, you know, a war on drugs, which has really been also a war on our public health measures. Um, and we, we have continued to diminish the importance of people who have literally decades of experience that know more about dealing with these things than anybody else in our state. And yet somehow, because of criminalization, we have lost that standing as it's transmitted through our legislator. And I just wanna emphasize that I fully believe that because of criminalization, we have been prevented from making greater headway in dealing with this crisis. And I'll give you two very stark reasons why. One is the Uniform Controlled Substances Act at the federal level, which prohibits objective research from occurring on any illicit substance. So the reason why we do not have more information about these chemicals, how they affect the body, how they affect the brain, how they affect the fabric of our society is because the federal government prohibits it by law. We're not permitted to do research on something that is killing hundreds of people in Rhode Island, and we can't even legally ask the question why and get an answer. That is absolutely absurd. And the second reason why, 
The second reason for it being so difficult to deal with through criminalization is that when we tell people that they're doing something wrong, we blame them. That blame for people who are vulnerable invariably converts to shame. It becomes internalized. They own it. They begin to take a part in a narrative that has forces far beyond their control, steering their life in the direction where we all know that it ends for far too many of these people. Jails, institutions, and death. And when we continue to progress the criminal agenda, we take away the one thing from people that we know works in recovery. We take their hope away. When we tell people that we want to see them go to jail for life, we're also telling them, their families, their communities, that we don't even believe in your capacity to change. We have ripped the very hope away from our society, the very hope that the people in recovery, the one recognized way to actually address addiction directly, this is the antidote, people, is inspired by hope. We take the fundamental tools that we need in every one of our communities away from the people who need it most. And we ask ourselves, why do things keep getting worse? We're at fault. If we could have put more money into schools instead of prisons, we could have stymied a lot of the impact of childhood adverse trauma. And we would have far less people that are struggling with the profound levels of addiction that we're seeing in our society today. It was a really, really amazing study that was redone. And it was drawn on the original mouse study that was done in the 1950s and 60s that gave us the clinical definition, the way that we defined addiction as it occurred in our society. And so what they did is they took these mice and they locked them in these tiny cages. And they, they hooked them up to a dose of heroin, they stuck a needle in their jugular vein and they strapped it there. And then they trained these mice that if they wanted, they could push this pedal and the response was they would get a jolt of heroin. And what they found invariably in this study, in these settings, that as mice became opioid dependent, as they continued to use, that increasingly they would increase the frequency of the dosaging until many of them died as a result. In more recent years, this study has been revisited because we understand a lot more about good research methods. And in the replicated study that was done, there were two control groups. There was one group which very much resembled the first group of mice, right? And they were kept in these isolated settings. They were kept, you know, with the same pedal mechanism. And they were given dosages of heroin for 57 days. By, by and far long enough that we would have granted them a clinical definition of being opioid dependent. And in the second group, these mice were given two bottles. One of them was water only. One of them was water that was infused with opiates. And they were given a robust and healthy social environment to live in. And what we found occurring in that environment was absolutely fascinating. That the mice, by and large, chose to participate in healthy, normal, social mouse behavior, even with open access to opiates. And that the opiate use that occurred, by and large, resembled our recreational use, that is the most common form of use in our society today. And we overlook that when we talk about substance policy. We just talk about the, the, the minority, right? Because we don't talk about recreational use. Like it, like it can't be not problematic. That's another problem with criminalization. But then what happened after that is they took this first group of mice out of their cages and stuck them in with the other group of mice. And what happened at that point was absolutely revolutionary to our understanding of addiction. Every single one of those mice when put into a normal, healthy social atmosphere with access to all of the things that we know that mice thrive on, voluntarily chose to go through withdrawal and then their behavior became indistinguishable from the first group of mice 
that were only occasionally participating in recreational use. We have fundamentally flawed ourselves in our approach to the addiction epidemic with a flawed definition of addiction. Our understanding of addiction has come from severely flawed research and from bottlenecked opportunities that have been prevented because of criminalization. So as much as I support the work of law enforcement, and I do believe there are very good instances where law enforcement should definitely be involved in a process, I think that many of the law enforcement tools that we have are inhibitive. They prevent us from progressing in our solutions, and they also actively contribute to the problem. And I don't think that there's any other way we're going to be able to truly move forward in dealing with this crisis until we can come to grips with that. Excellent. Okay, we're going to switch things up a little bit. I'm going to bring Ann Jane in. And Henry, why don't you come with me? And then um, what I want to both of you to do is before we leave tonight, I'll close up the show. For both of you, I want to give sort of a, a heartfelt, a polite shout out to the governor and tell her well, what, what you think. Okay. All right. Joining us just now again is from Rhode Island, Rhode Island's Protect Families First, Anna Jane. Hello. So, did I get it right this time? Yes. Okay. For, thank you. Um, again, let's keep the conversation going. Yeah. Um, Anna Jane, jump in there and tell me what you think the right model is going forward. Yeah. What What do, what do we need to do as a culture, as a society, mm -hmm. and then finally as a state? Mm -hmm. Because I think the first two are far more important than the quote unquote state. So um, when I talk with people who are think, wanting to support their loved ones, who they are concerned about their substance use or their substance abuse with, um, what I say is that the drug use is not the problem. The drug use is the symptom of another problem. So I say, when I talk to people, I say, I'm concerned about whatever circumstances got you to this point, and I'm concerned about the potential harmful consequences of this action you're taking. And by focusing on the things that lead up to that and the potential consequences, I think that really opens up a conversation that's not based in stigma or judgment, but it's really based on care and love for a person. And I think that's a better place to start from and a place that people are more open and receptive to, and it's really meeting the person where they're at. So in terms of thinking of whatever got to a person to that place, it could be trauma, it could be a certain circumstance, it, um, you know, it could be a lot of different things, and those are really big structural issues that, uh, that we need as, as a society and as a state to really fundamentally take on and take on holistically. And those are big problems. They take courage and bravery and resources to take on, and I really um, ask that we choose to, to take on those things to prevent um, the suffering that leads people to choose to use substances to cope with that suffering. And then for the next part, you know, when I say I'm concerned about some of the potential consequences of this behavior, that brings us to a philosophy called harm reduction. And a harm reduction is the philosophy that, you know, people, you can't just tell people to say no. We've tried that for decades. It hasn't been working very well. You can't just, you know, slap people on the wrist. wrist. Um, people will choose to to take behaviors that have harmful consequences, whether it's reckless driving, whether it's unsafe sex, whether it is using drugs. And so the best intervention is to mitigate some of the harms associated with that behavior to keep people healthy, to keep people safe, and to, and most importantly, to keep people alive. So one potential um, analogy I like to make is that many of us do a very dangerous thing every day, um, which is we drive in a moving vehicle and this is potentially deadly and we just do it like it you know every day like it's like it's no big deal however we put a lot of protections in place to keep people safe and alive and these are harm reduction techniques so we have stop signs we have seat belts we have airbags um, we encourage people not to drink and drive we have all these protections in place and the number of traffic fatalities has greatly reduced because of that and there are similar um, strategies that we can use for drug use so we have things like access to naloxone, the overdose reversal drug, which literally keeps people alive. And so that is a harm reduction technique. Or we have drug checking techniques so that people can see what substance they're using and make more informed choices when using a black market or illicit substance. People can use drugs in groups. Um, you know, people can use less of a drug. There are different things that people can do to mitigate their harm. And so coming from a place of love and meeting people where they're at rather than stigma and shame, which is just gonna make people 
um, not want to disclose information or not want to seek help, I think is important in addition to thinking about the structural suffering that leads people to the place where they choose to use drugs. So I'd say that holistically that's, um, that's the philosophy that I come from. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Michael. I don't think I could have said it any better. You, know, yeah. you always amaze me every time you talk about this because you have such a matter-of-fact way of speaking about something that really is both very big picture and very little picture. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, I think, the difficult thing for people to encapsulate with this. What I, what I want to encourage, too, is that, you know, what we understand about recovery, right, is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all model for people that for as many different people as there are, there are different pathways to recovery. Mm -hmm. And so there is no one recognized solution. So what we've learned about harm reduction that works is a person-centered mm -hmm. and self-directed approach. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we ask a person what we think works for them mm -hmm. and what they think will make them be safer mm -hmm. and what they're willing to do, right? And we genuinely meet them where they're at. Yeah. And we do this for almost every other kind of um, health condition and I, I, I avoid the word disease because I don't want people to get the misunderstanding that addiction is a contagion because I very much don't feel that that is accurate um, in a lot of my understanding of it it can act very similar to an immune disease where somebody is potentially having their resilience to dependence impacted by various biopsychosocial factors um, and so their likelihood to develop a dependence is contingent on these number of factors that contribute to a, a lack of immunity, for, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, and so what we can do is look for ways to try to buffer people's resilience and to try to foster resilience, not only at the individual level, but at the family level and at the community level. And I think that all three levels are equally important when we're dealing with this. You know, we get so caught up on treating the patient mm -hmm. that we lose track of the fact that, you know, this is not something that exists in its own bubble. There are things happening in the family around that person. There are things happening at schools around people. Um, we know that bullying still is occurring at a very high rate in our school system. And so there are all these moving parts and we can't take our eye off of that each one of those parts has a piece of the culpability in somebody developing an addiction much farther down the road. So we need to really look at all of these different things starting in early childhood. And I really want to emphasize there because as we move further as a society from family solidarity, as we've experienced increased economic demands, which has caused people to have to work longer hours and spend more time away from their family, we expose children to a lot more vulnerability than we have at any other time in our history. And it's no surprise that we see so much more problem with addiction. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the upward sloping trend in one follows alongside the upward sloping trend in the other. And in most cases, that's how we figure out where causality is. So I just want us to be thoughtful about that. And, and I'm really interested in hearing a little bit more of, of your perspective of, of the big to little yeah. and, and what that what that is from your experience. Yeah, and I think you bring up a piece where, you know, um, you know, addiction is being understood more as a health or a mental health thing that's, you know, obviously within the societal context, but um, that that's, an, that's a thing people say. I mean, people do say addiction is a disease. But I also want to reiterate and bring this back to Christian's law, which passed out of the House yesterday, that we are at a critical juncture right now to make a decision if we are going to treat addiction as a health or societal problem or treat it as a criminal problem. And I think what we have now is we have a, a, a par two parallel systems where we're treating some people as criminals and we're warehousing people in prisons and those tend to be disproportionately low income communities, um, communities of color. And then we have another system where we're treating people as patients, right, where we're connecting people to treatment and um, people to social services and those are disproportionately white people, right? And I think that we need to have an honest conversation about how we are treating everyone um, and making sure that we are building solutions that work for everyone. You know, not only meeting people where they're at individually, but as a society, thinking about where we're meeting groups of people at. 
That makes sense. And I just want to touch on something that's come up quite a bit in talking about prison experiences, something I have personal experience with. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that the meager benefits of a, a prison system, and so there are these reports of people finding recovery in prison. I just want to emphasize that those experiences are radically no different than an experience of somebody going into a residential treatment program, where the separation from the environment, the separation from the routine behaviors, the replacement with a new social grouping and potentially some supported services, um, that we do find that residential settings and treatment are far more effective and less costly than sending people to prison. Yet, somehow we've been able to prioritize getting people into prison on demand, right? But not into treatment on demand. You know, we have hundreds of callers waiting in line on 942 stop. And I don't want to downplay that this is a great step forward for us to actually have a hotline for people to call to get connected with their supports. But there are hundreds of people who have health insurance, don't have health insurance, nobody knows because nobody's following up. Do they have their identifications? Do they? So there's lots of barriers there for people to get access to their treatment. And so what happens by default? When our system fails them, they get subjected to the incarceration system. And that's largely been our solution. And I think that there's a sentiment in the United States which is like, what do we do? This is such a big problem and it is such a big and tragic problem and too many people are dying. However, I do think that there are tools and there are examples in the world that we can learn from, right? So there are places that have really addressed this problem in a more proactive, in a more public health, and in a more compassionate way than we have done for generations with the war on drugs. And so earlier I mentioned my experience going to Portugal where they decriminalize drug possession and treat it more as a health problem or as an administrative problem rather than as a criminal problem. And that has been very successful. You know, the number of heroin users went down by 75%. Youth drug use did not change at all, in fact, decreased a little bit. And the number of overdose deaths plummeted. So when we think about what can we do in Rhode Island, well, we can look at other places in the world that have had successful interventions, such as Portugal, um, to be able to think about ways to keep people alive, keep people safe, keep people healthy. And I know that's a big step. I know that requires a change of hearts and minds. That requires just a whole different analysis of this issue. However, we do have solutions out there. We just need to, we need to be brave enough to access those solutions. Yeah, I, I feel that we very much, you know, we felt challenged as a society in our morality. Mm -hmm. And I just want to encourage people to be bold in challenging the assumption that this is a moral issue. You know, we have seen solutions. You mentioned Portugal. Switzerland did an incredible job of providing legal regulated access to heroin and saw a 50% reduction in the heroin use across their country. You know, the work of Dr. Brandon Marshall I referenced earlier I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, he's a professor of epidemiology at Brown School of Public Health. Uh, he came from Vancouver, Canada, where he uh, was part of a team that uh, oversaw the services at a place called Insight, which is a medically supervised safe consumption center. And I just want to emphasize that in medically supervised safe consumption centers, not only in Vancouver, but everywhere in the world where they exist, there has never been a death from an overdose within the walls of a safe consumption center anywhere in the world, ever in the history of these facilities. So you want to talk about a certain cure, you get 100% of people into safe consumption centers, you get 100% reduction in death from overdose. So I just want to make sure there's a clear line drawn there. So then it becomes a question of how do we get them into safe consumption centers. And I just want to touch on a little bit of the critique of that, because I talked to Brandon Marshall about some of the criticisms that have emerged, like most controversial and cutting edge programs, people had felt very strongly about the concentration of resources, and how they felt there was more people struggling with addiction there. And what the study that they produced actually found something that was quite, quite to the contrary, that people who are utilizing safe consumption services were more than, were twice as likely to initiate recovery efforts from that setting than people who are left at large in the general population. And just in a kind of an anecdotal conversation between uh, Dr. Brandon Marshall and myself in a recent strategy meeting, 
uh, we had talked about kind of informally what the neighborhood conditions were like. And I had asked him, you know, about how he felt that had changed during the course of, of Insight's presence in the community. And he said, well, yes, as outsiders have come in, they've made great comment about the, the conditions of the neighborhood. But boy, if you would have seen it before we put this thing there, there is no comparison. It is significantly better now than it was then. And the only genuine criticism that would be sensible is to have a distribution of resource that's widely spread and not singularly concentrated. And we just know that that's good public policy. We don't put all the poor people who need to live in subsidized housing in one place. We spread them out, right? Because we know that community reintegration is helpful, right? So just being thoughtful about that, I definitely want to say that I look forward to having future conversations about uh, supervised safe consumption and the underlying legal barriers that we've experienced, you know, particularly criminalization, to being able to deliver these services in our communities. And I think that gets to a point that the things that are, some of the things that are evidence-based have many of the, these barriers, legal barriers, moralistic barriers, values barriers, political barriers, and those barriers are real and we're at a point where we need to try to overcome those barriers and so I encourage um, our legislators, um, our governor to learn more about those and to think about ways in which we can overcome those barriers literally to save lives. So I definitely want to just kind of strongly assert as we're kind of coming down to the end of our segment here that the resounding message that I hope the governor hears from this, and as it was raised through the harm reduction work group, there was virtually unanimous support for a formal recommendation. Somehow that was not heard when we moved into the, the full task force meeting on Wednesday, but it was voiced by Michelle McKenzie at that meeting that we most certainly want to see the governor exercise prudent judgment and that the best answer to this legislative effort is a veto. Yeah, I encourage the governor to stand with the medical community, to stand with public health experts who literally sit around your overdose task force, to stand with people who have lived experience with substance use disorder, to stand with people who are in recovery, um, to hear the resounding message um, to veto this legislation, and to work with everyone at the table towards better legislation that can address its intended cause and actually try and keep people alive. I'm going to jump in here for a second. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. I'll meet you guys outside in just okay. a minute. I'm going to just, because I'm going to get political here for a second. Yeah. And I'll spare you guys that. Joe, we're still live, right? Yeah. So I'm going to make an appeal. If you happen to see the show tonight, if you see the show over the weekend, if you see clips of the show, the governor is embroiled in a very challenging election season. There are many alternatives to elect a governor other than Gina Raimondo. There are times when litmus tests are and aren't acceptable. This is certainly a time when one is. If folks in the recovery community, folks of good spirit, folks of goodwill, folks who had family members or currently have family members, loved ones, friends, business associates who are in the throes of addiction, with blessings they may be in, in, in a variety of levels of recovery, this governor needs to hear politely, loudly and clearly, that this bill must be vetoed. There are a few times in the 15 or 20 years I've been following politics here in Rhode Island when I've seen a unanimity in such a different and varying groups of political groups, professional groups, over a single issue. And this is the only one. Whether it have been tolls, baseball stadiums, legalizing cannabis, lots of people have lots of different opinions. The medical community, the caregiving community, the support community, the recovery community, and significant parts of the legal community all agree that this legislation is terrible. People will die. People will die unnecessarily. People who might have had an opportunity to engage in recovery will lose that chance. People will go to prison. 
families will be destroyed. On a secondary basis, our economy will suffer. Taxes will rise. We will engage in different types of health, public health crises because of the fear of recrimination where people simply won't engage with whatever recovery facilities we do have. The governor has an opportunity to do the right thing. The governor has an opportunity to be a hero here. This does not preclude additional conversation next year on these issues. It does not preclude healthy debate. It does not to diminish the idea that we as a society need to address the opioid addiction crisis. What a veto does do is give an opportunity for people of goodwill from a variety of communities to come together in a manner not fraught with political danger, not fraught with political pressure, where individual legislators are given the opportunity to learn and the capacity to decide for themselves. So in closing, Governor Raimondo, should you hear this, don't know that you will, but Perhaps a few of your interns or your political colleagues may, uh, may turn an open ear and an open mind to this situation and understand that the entire state is watching. We will react. We will judge. And decisions in November must and should be based on the consequences of her decision this week to sign this awful, awful legislation. So I'll spare you the normal closings and the normal radio patter. Governor, do the right thing.